He was a bit of a clown all week. <laughs> that was so that was serious. Yeah. I'll, I'll say that was rude. <laughs> Four player presented by Barstool Sports brought to you by our great friends at Chevy, Chevy.com slash electric. Go check them out. The bow tie iconic models been, uh, at the forefront of the electric vehicle game for a decade now. So Chevy.com slash electric Ryder cup recap. We got Frankie and Dan are in Rome. We had the concession around the world that Ricky just had a few minutes ago. We got people jumping in the pond. Uh, our good friend of the program, Joe LaCava, I still would say was the hero of the Ryder cup 2023. He made a bad Ryder cup fucking amazing. So we got a shit ton to get to, but energy's high. Europe's about to celebrate. Zach Johnson's doing interviews right now, who was Trent's guy. So he's asked to answer for a lot of things. But wow, what a uh, what a week. What a week. Uh, yeah, I don't know who wants to go first here. We got two guys in Rome. I feel like they should probably go first. It, it was on the verge of being a total snooze um, until Saturday night, really, or until Saturday evening. Like until that story surfaced, uh, the Hatgate story, which from what I understand is just is not true. I mean, Patrick Cantlay does want to be paid for the Ryder Cup, but there's not some sort of like big rift in the team room. He's not, it's not like some sort of big protest. So Jamie Weir drops that story. It's amazing how online the entire world is now because one guy drops a story and the entire crowd two hours later is waving their hats. It spread like wildfire and it lit a fire under Team USA. It, it, the LaCava Rory interaction wouldn't have happened without Hatgate. So Jamie Weir was an absolutely central figure in this Ryder Cup. That's an incredible spin for Jamie Weir, I will say, because everyone else is like, this guy reported something that is just not true at all. But I actually agree with what you're saying, where it would have been such a boring Ryder Cup if we didn't have that. Team USA was getting blown out of the fucking water. And then Jamie Weir drops a four tweet thread and it lights the entire world on fire, including Team USA and Patrick Cantlay. Without that, I don't know what happens at the end of this Ryder Cup. They might have won it on Saturday. Truly incredible. The, the 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 feeling here in in Rome, you could tell that all of that juice was needed. All the fans needed something to go after the USA about because it just was there was nothing there. It felt like it was just like USA was playing poorly and Europe was playing incredibly. We couldn't make putts. They were draining things on top of us every single fucking hole. Every single putt. Every single putt was going in on Friday and Saturday. Now all of a sudden we have this thing to go after. So they're going after JT out here in the golf course. He's tipping no cap to them. Everything about today is what the Ryder Cup should be. Being out there today, I had the inside the Rose pass. Thanks to Danny Rappaport. Absolutely incredible, incredible scenes out there. There were feelings towards the end, towards the end that we really were going to do it. Like I was standing right next to team USA. Like you got, you got Colin Morikawa and Max Holman. They're all standing there looking at each other like, dude, we might pull this off like that like you know we have one more match to flip here at the time when jt was on 17 you're looking at that scoreboard and you're like there's one more blue up there there's one blue and it's only up one like we can make this happen so that was exciting um the european fans were incredible they're funny i do want to give a shout out to justin thomas who battled his fucking dick off we went to battle for that guy to make the team a lot of people gave him shit i'm sure you guys are going to get into it I just was very, very proud of that guy because he is what the Ryder Cup is everything is what it's supposed to be. He cares very deeply. He gets into it with the fans. Today he was just he was amazing with the fans. They're all screaming at him and he kept tipping his cap to them. Which on TV I feel like would make it look like he's being an asshole where it's like nonstop just air tipping a cap. But if you were there, he was giving every single gallery that laughing moment. Like he was a showman. So like they're all screaming at him. And it's kind of like, what is that, that Joe DiMaggio quote where it's like, it, it's, a, it's a kid's first time ever seeing you uh, every single game. I felt like JT felt that way with the galleries where he's like, I haven't done this cap tip thing with all these people yet. And every time he did it, they all gave him a round of applause and a laugh. So I just wanted to give him a shout out because I saw that on the grounds. He's an amazing, amazing person to have on this team. 12 points on Sunday is a win, no, no matter how you slice it. I mean, by all accounts, Team USA was getting dog walked all weekend. And when you have 12 points on a Sunday, there's always that chance. You start to see a little bit more red, less blue. Oh, these ties. We got to flip those late matches. And it got to a point out, you know, before Ricky Fowler sliced one into the water where every match was coming down to 18. And it was like, we just got to get a full point here. We got to get a full point here. Obviously that started with Max, who is a motherfucking stud. Just the biggest balls on planet earth had such a good weekend. One of the few bright spots for 
Team America or Team USA. So, yeah, I know 12 points on Sunday is a win because you can be getting blown out. And if certain things fall one way, you can still have a close finish. Now, I don't the final. We're recording just as this got done. So I don't know what the final is exactly going to be, but it's not going to look like it's not going to look all that close. But there were moments there was like a 30 minute period at the end there where it was like Team USA has a real, real chance to pull off this upset. Yeah, I, I think the the Ryder Cup uh is is my biggest takeaway is how much of a disconnect there is from when you're there versus when you're watching on tv and i had a lot of friends texting me about the incident last night joe lacava the hat waving what you cannot convey to people through tv especially with the coverage which we're going to talk about which was the worst it's ever been in the history of coverage ever coverage had to be better in like the during the civil war of things that were going on than it was during the fucking Ryder cup this year but you cannot convey to people what it is like for these guys to be inside the ropes behind enemy lines for four hours straight hearing nonstop your feet away from the fans. It's not like football where you have a separation. It's not like hockey where you're on the ice. There's boards. There's a separation. The game happens fast and then it's over. And you can't really hear. It is personal. It is intimate. You are walking inside the ropes. You're only hitting golf shots for five, ten minutes total out of that four and a half hours, four hours. And the rest of the time, you are just hearing it from the crowd and it is an intense emotional situation that is going to lead to emotional crazy reactions it's going to spill over it's going to escalate and it does and when they just cut to somebody like frankie said they just cut to jt you haven't seen jt in an hour he makes a putt and then does a hat tip thing to you watching on tv exactly it doesn't you know maybe you're like oh cool but a lot of people it's like oh that came off as a little douchey where'd that come from where you're like no, dude, JT has been hearing nonstop for the last three hours. Everybody yelling at him. I'm sure most people are respectful. Some people aren't. He's giving it back to him. He's a showman. He's the reason we wanted him on the team. And it is. It's like Kobe said. It's like, those, you know, those guys have said, like, they want to play every night because you got to give it to those people. That's what makes it real. That's what makes it awesome. We had Scotty Scheffler fucking crying yesterday because he got beat so bad. We've had Rory cry. We had John Rahm after his interview saying that he was crying off camera this week. Like, that it's just as emotional as it could possibly get. And it's really hard to wrap your head around that unless you're there. And when you're there, you're like, how are people not crying right now? Yeah, they're definitely respectful, but they're def it gets under your skin. It gets under your skin quick. Like, I mean, one guy was like, JT, you have the worst hairline I've ever seen in my entire life. The place was dead quiet. And he just looked at him and he goes, I know. Like, I'm talking on hole 15, <laughs> right? Like, the whole entire match is coming down to this thing. And he just right. goes... He looks at the guy. He goes, "I know. Like, I, I don't know. What to, like, I'm doing a whole no hat thing because of the can't. I like, can't lay. Like, I wish I was wearing a hat here, but like, I was trying to gain some momentum. It's just they're they're nonstop. They are funny, but that's what the Ryder Cup is. You know, you're coming on to foreign soil, and they're going to give it to you. Now, I saw a lot of receipt talk on Twitter. You know, I that's true. Like, fans do keep receipts, and I think Beth Page is going to be a nasty one. Beth Page is going to get real muddy. It's going to get real dirty. It's going to get real murky." I'm supposed to be on day one of my honeymoon right now, so I'm going to talk a little quick. I'm going to get all my takes out there. This is how I spent my first day of the honeymoon. It's an absolute waste of time, if you ask me. But the second <laughs> thing I want to say on top of that is um, it's a disaster. Like, like Trent, you did say, like, it's a win. This was a disaster. Like, like, the United States came – you said like having twelve points feels like a win, which like I no, know. No, I was saying I was saying no. I'm saying from just a an event perspective, not a win for the team. No, no. Okay, okay. We have to clarify that because this was. An oh yeah, no. I was utter, saying like having the, like no. I was saying having that many points on the board possible on the last day is is an event win. Yeah, it looked like we could have mathematically been out of it Saturday night. Yes, so like I know you. what you're saying. But, yes, <laughs> but but yeah, it was event. a disaster. It was a disaster. They got absolutely yeah. swept out of the building. It was a laughing stock. The matchups were a fucking joke. Zach Johnson's the worst captain they've ever had in the history of anything. I mean, you're going to get it yeah. a little bit on this. I mean, he's the worst ha captain, I think, in any sport of uh, ever. Yeah, no, it was not good. I, I'm not going to stand here and pound my chest and say that Cedar Rapids, Iowa, well, that was a victory for us. I think there, I think there's a lot of things that go into it. I, but in an event like this, so there's, you need somebody to blame for sure. And that's going to fall on the captain because I mean, this team fucking, dog walk team europe at whistling straights and then you come here and it's like all right now the the picks come into question should it have been keegan should it have been dj should it have been bryson the first the first session should jt and speed have been out there the answer is probably yes like there's definitely mistakes that were made by zach johnson that is undeniable but there's it's not always one thing it'll probably fall on him mostly but i'll also say like team europe played incredible those first three sessions Team America, Team USA played fucking horrible. Like 
like Brooks Kepka and Scotty Scheffler lost nine and seven. If if Zach gives a better pump up speech or plays a hype video, does that match end on fifteen instead of eleven? Like at a certain point, the players that are there are the best players in the world, at least some of them, and they got to play a little bit better. But again, Zach Johnson definitely didn't have the greatest showing. Like that, he is going to take the brunt of the criticism, and I fully understand that, and he he deserves it to a degree. But there are factors where it's like that first day, dude. Rom was all over it. Everybody's hole now from everywhere. That 18th hole, it looked like America was going to grab a bunch of momentum and then just shit the bed, shit the bed, shit the bed. And again, I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, so I don't know how much you know hype was going into it. I know the the team rooms are apparently pretty opposite. Like Luke Donald's playing all of these hype up videos, and Sevy is very involved, and they've got a Sevy locker, and like that's that's burning fire for Team Europe. I don't know how much Zach was doing of that, but again, like. Even if you hype this, this this team up with like videos and speeches, you get blown out nine and seven. I don't know how much Zach Johnson is going to affect that. So I, I get that he's going to take most of it, but that you know he it, it is what it is. Yeah, I, I think you know there's a, there's a few things that you, you talk about second guessing Zach Johnson that that come to mind, and one of them is none of nine of the twelve Americans uh, didn't play a tournament for five weeks before. And this is something that it's the nature of the beast. If the U.S. wins, no one talks about it, but they didn't win. So we're going to talk about it. Every single European yeah. played two weeks ago uh, at Wentworth and they all played very well. It's hard to know who's playing well when no one's played a tournament in the last five weeks. Number one. Number two, they landed like on Sunday night or maybe even Monday morning, which is like when I got here. So the first couple of days, you're learning the golf course. None of these guys have played the Italian Open, and they're basically asleep. Uh, it took them until really Friday, Saturday afternoon to hit their stride. Now, is that because of rust? Is that because of jet lag? I don't know, but it does feel like the Europeans are willing to do more for the Ryder Cup. That, that doesn't mean they're going to win it because, you know, Steve Stricker was as hands off as you could possibly be at Whistling Straits, and the U.S. dominated but the Europeans leaned all the way into this, not just, you know, playing all of them at Wentworth, but they kind of embrace the cringe of the week, right? Like they lean all the way into those hype videos where the Americans are like, we, like, we don't need this. You know what I mean? So I just think the, the Europeans, and I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a, a cultural thing where, you know, they're, they're sort of less, take themselves a little bit less seriously, but it just feels like they were more willing to sacrifice than the Americans. And I also think the pairings, there were no, there were no, you know, they, Zach said that data and analytics were, were considered, but, you know, I follow a bunch of data people online and, and Scheffler and Burns and JT and Spieth were uh, by all available data, two horrible picks. But I think the, the European, the Americans, just the players have a lot more power. Whereas in Europe, the captains have power. So if the European team, they're saying you guys are playing together, the Europeans are like, great, let's do it. The Americans, it almost seems like, oh, who do you, who do you guys want to play with? Yeah, there's only so much you can do as a captain. You're not hitting physical golf shots. And I think when you kind of get dog walked in day one and you're like, I'm proud of these guys, it just sets a really bad tone, whether that be on the internet and the media, like it just changes the tone of the championship of the cup. And like, I think that falls on him. Like it's, it's his job to somehow, some way make that narrative different. And he didn't. And like, then he's like, there's a bug going around the room. I'm he made not an excuse disclose. immediately. It just felt like there were excuses and he's proud of them. And it's just like, that's all you can do as a captain. You're not, you have no other impact on the, on the cup other than what is the narrative in the room. And he just missed it. Yeah. Uh, you know, look, I, the not playing for five weeks thing, I think Paul McGinley made the point of, could you fathom any one of these guys going to the Masters and they haven't played a tournament for five weeks or to the U.S. Open or to any of this? They would never, ever, ever do that. They clearly, like, you know, they kind of treated as the offseason leading up uh, three guys or whatever it was played a couple weeks ago. Uh, but other than that, it, it's they probably in their heads were like, oh, we'll be fresh. We'll be fine. I doubt they treated it in their own minds as like some sort of issue or some sort of lack of preparation. But to Dan's point, it's like your captain doesn't know who's playing that well because it was five weeks ago. You're not tournament fresh because you haven't played in five weeks. You would never do that for a major championship. So why would you do it for the Ryder Cup unless the only answer would be that you don't think it's as important as a major championship. And then when they get out there, they're not quite as prepared. They're not quite as sharp. And and that was obvious. I, you know, I haven't really seen Brian Harmon like 
missing fairways and shit like that all in a year. And it's like, well, he hasn't played, you know. So that type of stuff I thought was very clear that U.S. was just rusty. They had not been in competition in a long time. And next thing you know, they're down 4-0 after the first session. And that first session, to go to back to the Zach Johnson thing of like, I get that foursomes alternate shot their strengths and weaknesses, and that's fine. But when you bring over Brooks Kepka and Justin Thomas, two guys who are sort of your your major champions, who are kind of backbones, Brooks Kepka in a very different way than JT. Brooks Kepka is sort of all business, kind of the macho guy. He's pretty quiet out there, and he's just going to steamroll people with his biceps. And all the announcers think he looks like a fucking linebacker. And then you got JT, he's doing the hat tips and crazy. When you leave both those guys on the bench Friday morning and you're down 4 nothing, and both of those guys were captain's picks, it's like, why the fuck did you bring these guys over? Why did you pick them if you're not going to put them out there? Next thing you know, you're down 4 nothing, And then the Friday afternoon thing was devastating. Like, there, we should have, it felt like, been down five and a half, three and a half or so, which is totally fine going into Saturday. They start making putts. Hoblin makes a 25-footer. Rom hits the back of the hole, bounces up, goes in. Justin Rose has his first, like, he even said it afterwards. He's like, I've won points, but I've never had my Ryder Cup moment. That was my moment. All three of these, those things happen in rapid succession. And we go from five and a half, three and a half to, like, whatever it was, six and a half to one and a half without winning a, a full point the whole day. And you're like, what the fuck just happened? And then by the time we got to our strengths, which is four ball, which is singles, it was just too much to overcome, and it's a tough look that it's like Ricky Fowler wiped one into the water to lose it, but you're really in that spot on Friday afternoon, uh, which stinks. And then the Zach Johnson thing, it's like for, the first thing we got to kind of lay the groundwork of is like these aren't hired coaches that have been training to be coaches, man. Zach Johnson is Cedar Rapids guy. By all accounts, it's a fucking miracle. He is who he is. He knows that. His like collegiate golf and all that. He wasn't one of these Ludwig uh, Oberg kind of guys or John Rahm. He goes out, he wins the Masters, he wins the Open at St. Andrews, and the next thing you know, he's like for two years, basically like the the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys kind of. It's like you're all of a sudden in the forefront of like leading this team, and and some guys just aren't built for that. And I thought it was very clear that like Zach Johnson was not built for that. He didn't say the right things. He didn't look like particularly confident he looked a little bit like abrasive in interviews he did he would do this a lot of like well you know and and it just that kind of rubs people the wrong way especially when you're down for nothing and I would argue like Steve Stricker was actually pretty similar but his team performed and he did a very good job of just kind of giving you nothing like he just basically in those types of scenarios was like I love my guys this is great Uh, you know best team ever Whereas I, Zach Johnson was just giving you a little bit too much that was not likable. And then he had the moment with Spieth where I doubt that he really was that impactful. Like, I, you know, but it looked like he basically said, hey, Spieth, hit three wood in the water here and like ruin the whole tournament. <laughs> I obviously, did, that like obviously didn't happen, but it looked like it happened. And then that combined with everything else, you're like, well, this guy's a fucking disaster. So it's a little bit like he's not supposed to be that guy for the moment, kind of. And he is. And when it doesn't go well, you know, it's almost better. It, it's honestly almost better that he does take the blame because you want these players in two years at Beth Page to be like, yeah, well, you know, like I get we didn't play our best, but like leadership, you know, like you almost want a scapegoat because Zach Johnson will be gone. He'll be on the fucking assistant captain list now for a couple yeah. of Ryder Cups and like who really cares? Whereas you want Scotty and JT and Spieth and Morikawa to feel confident for Ryder Cups going forward. So it's almost better for USA. Just fucking blame Zach Johnson and let the other guys feel better about themselves, even though that's really probably not fair to Zach Johnson. It will be interesting to see what happens at these post-round press conferences, which we're going to cover once we once they happen. But that's where it can go sideways, or it can go totally fine. It can go Tom Watson, Phil Mickelson, or it can just be like, yeah, no, I love all the guys in this room, and um, you know, we just I wish we had played better, and blah 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 blah. I, I think it'll probably go fine, but it, they might just bust toss him. Uh, it'd be very interesting to see. Um, but yeah, no, it's Zach's going to get crushed, and he's been getting crushed, and. That's just the nature of of the Ryder Cup, honestly. Like uh, it's it is what it is. I don't know what else. I'm not again. I'm not going to stand here and be like, no. If if you know, I think Zach did a great job, and it just didn't break his way. No, it went fucking horribly. He was a bit of a clown all week, and I, I think back to on Friday, <laughs> Matt Fitzpatrick <laughs> and and Tommy Fleetwood both had to ask him to that was move. So serious. <laughs> all I'll say that was rude. <laughs> Like, like that's got to be a clip. That's just got to be the number one social clip. He he was standing too close to the tee two times, and and Finno, uh, he, uh, Tommy's caddy, who's like the scariest person in the world, was like Zach, 
and he backs up. And then Matt Fitzpatrick, in, in classic Matt Fitzpatrick's terms, was like so deferential. Was like, um, I'm so sorry, Zach, but can you just stand on the other side of the tee? And Zach goes, looks at him and goes, 100. percent And it's like, just what are you, what are you doing? Like, what? First of all, what are you doing standing there? Second of all, what are you doing responding in that way? He can't talk in front of a microphone to save his life. Perfectly nice guy. <laughs> I just think he's going to. There's a reason that he's getting all of the heat. Like, you have to turn over every stone in order to, you know, win a Ryder Cup on the road. Uh, and he didn't do it. He didn't do it at all. And it, you feel bad because the Europeans played better. And this team, this European team was so much better than the European team at Whistling Straits. That European team at Whistling Straits had a bunch of guys in their mid-40s. I mean, they, they looked visibly the worst team. They had total reinforcements. Ludwig played very well for the beginning. He wasn't very good in the end. Victor is probably the finest golfer in the world at the moment. And Rom was, un Rom was so like magical in the big moments chipping in for eagle on 16 holding that eagle on 18 today he he hits like a hundred foot putt to one inch it just felt like oh and then yesterday afternoon he, he hits on uh, on 17 he hits it to like two inches it, it just felt like rom had the magic rory four and one it was basically a perfect week for europe and the americans i think because everyone's friends in this tournament and i because all these guys are so rich and famous i don't think they're going to go out there and, and burn Zach Johnson like they did Tom Watson because Tom Watson was not friends with them. He was not one of their peers. He told them what to do. And they had a Phil Mickelson figure there who was like almost a, like a pseudo captain. This team, I think Zach let them do whatever they want and they lost. So they'll just be like, yeah, you know, it happens. We discussed it a little bit off the top, but you should go to Chevy.com slash electric right now. They've been at the forefront of the electric game. They've been making cars for 100 years. Think about that. 100 years. They've been making cars, the roaring 20s, the whole deal. The bow tie was there. Now they're there with the electric game. They've evolved. They're technologically advanced. They've got, uh, what, I think 100-something thousand 100 something thousand charging stations in the United States and North America. They get over 500 I'm sorry, they got over 5,550 EV trained technicians. They got over 1,900 certified EV dealerships. So you're looking to get into the EV game, which you should be. That's the future. Uh, Chevy.com slash electric. They're doing it better than anybody. 100 years. That's basically on the same Ryder Cup timeline, no? Is that? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's got to be pretty similar. Two titans of just the world where it's the Ryder Cup starts going. We're talking about that all in today's episode. And then Chevy also popped up at the same time. Those things have been around pretty much. The exact same amount of time. That's the golden age, man. That 1920s, that stretch right there, that's just about as good as it gets. The roaring 20s, the golf courses that came out of that time are iconic. It's just, it's nice to think about. Things were good. Um, Chevy, Chevy.com slash electric nationwide dealership is a true value to consumers because we Chevy are there for you with any electric vehicle question that you might have. You need to get, you know, up to date, learn, learning curve. Chevy's going to help you. So do yourself a favor and learn more at Chevy.com slash electric. Bring up John Rahm. It just reminded me on the 16th hole. Everyone was standing on the seventeenth hole. Everyone was standing behind the tee box watching that Justin Thomas match, and John Rahm was right next to me. And I wasn't saying anything. He's looking at sixteen green. He's looking at seventeen tee. And they hit their balls, and I go to walk around him and down towards the green. And some guy from Team Europe like grabbed my chest and pushed me away from John Rahm as if I was going to go up to him and like say something or like tackle him. And I looked at him and I was like. Why'd you do that? He's like, you're not getting anywhere near him. I was like, oh, all right, yeah. It it was it was a stunning. I think people were super on edge. It was like it was at that moment. I think Europe felt like it was maybe slipping away from them. But I just I forgot about that because it's been such a wild moment getting back here to the media center that that really that really was a thing that happened to me. Oh man, he was gonna take you out, dude. There, people are on I edge. Like, I yeah, saw. Dude, I don't know. Tommy's caddy almost, who hates Dan, almost spearheaded that fucking the the guy that jumped into the <laughs> yeah. water. He, dude, he, he, he took was, three, he took a step. He was dude. ready to go. He was so ready to he just was ready. If he would have just buried that guy, Adam Hadwin style. Oh, oh that would. Can we talk about, about? Can we talk about Ricky's concession? Because I want to get your guys' opinion. Because I, I of the group have probably played in the least amount of matches. I actually think it's by like a country mile. So I want your guys' opinion on. I, did he know the situation? Should he have done it? Like is he didn't. My take is he didn't okay. know. 
I like. He, he I think he know. knew it was important, but I don't think he knew it was to win the Ryder Cup. I think in the moment he hits it in the water, he hits a wedge up there. He's like, "This guy's got two feet for birdie. I've got five feet or whatever it was for par. Like that's good." I, I don't think he fully knew. That's my only explanation. I that's just total conjecture. I'm basically a golf journalist right now, just totally guessing on stuff. But I, I'm going to say that he did not know the situation. He couldn't know, right? Because you want him to make that putt. You have to make yeah. him putt it. They just, showed, to- they just showed Robert McIntyre missing a putt that was just as short, if not shorter, right before. To win right. the match. I mean, you say this all the time yep. when you're losing a match. You go, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm two down with two to go. You're going to have to putt it. But also not even for that. Just like you, you, you make the final putt to win the Ryder Cup, right? Like even if it's a fucking one foot tap in. Like you have to give Tom. If you're actually being that conscientious of the match and like you're being a good pal let him make the putt it's a way better he moment ruined than his just moment. like he ruined the moment we it's did like, that at the Ryder cup honestly it's right that, it's that's kirk. what reminded me of it <laughs> it's kirk kirk yeah he still hates me for that moment where that's exactly what we did in the writer cup where we just stole your moment it was like <laughs> it just like, felt like a very Ricky Fowler moment, you know, and, I, and I'm sure he'll get asked about it and we'll get all the details. But just to be like, oh, yeah, Tommy, you can have that one. And it's the Ryder Cup on the line. I don't know. He again, he makes it ninety nine point nine percent of the time. But you got to at least make him put it. I think you have to. I think you have to. I, my best guess is he didn't know because there's a lot going on. Matches are changing pretty quickly. I There's no way he knew that would be such a shocking move to give that up. But. I don't think it would have mattered. I think before we do let go of Frankie, we have to talk about the Joe LaCava situation. Yep. This took over everything. It completely transformed the Ryder Cup. The quick background, obviously, is the report that was just completely made up, I believe, uh, that went out yesterday on Saturday, took over the entire Ryder Cup, hatless. Everybody was chanting at uh, Patrick Cantley at every hole. He then transforms into uh, 2012 Ian Poulter, makes uh, birdie after birdie, huge putt, makes the huge putt on 18. People were going nuts. They're waving their hats. Joey LaCava is standing, not in Rory's line, but he's, you know, he's standing in the middle of the green, waving his hat like everybody else is. He does wave it uh, longer than everyone else. He stands pretty close to Rory, probably longer than he should have. Rory claps at him a little bit to some degree of like, all right, move it along here. Like, I got to get ready for my putt. Joey claps back at him. Then the people from Team Europe, like Shane Lowry, and then which were kind of off camera, but it appeared to be like Shane Lowry, Justin Rose were kind of chirping at Joey, like, get the fuck out of there. Why are you in Rory's like space? You're basically in his I'm preparing for a golf shot space. Rory continued to clap back at him, misses the putt. Matty Fitz misses the putt, left it short, actually, which was tough. Misses the putt. And then afterwards, they go handshake. Clearly wasn't over yet. Nobody really thought too much of it. A little bit of like, oh, yeah, that was spicy. Fine. But then the clip comes out while they're on live from Brandel and Paul McGinley and the crew of Rory losing his fucking mind with Bones. I think Joey was off camera, so he wasn't directly involved in that clip. But Bones, Joey, great friends, caddies forever. Bones is kind of there. Shane Lowry's trying to get Rory. Rory's pointing at him going, that's a fucking disgrace. The video goes nuts. Everybody's got their takes on it. My quick take that I'll give is... Obviously, I think everybody understands by the pure, pure etiquette of golf, Joey was probably a little bit out of line. But in the context of everything, Joey is the hero of that moment. Absolutely. He didn't go over there and grab Roy's putter while he's in his backstroke. He fucking stood in the middle of the green for a little bit too long, waving his hat, clearly trying to give it back to the fans, trying to get under people's skin a little bit. It worked. Europe was rattled. It lit a fucking spark. Again, technicality and golf etiquette. If you're writing a book, was he a little bit out of line? Sure. Fucking go more out of the line. Like, who gives a shit in that moment? It's the Ryder Cup. People are screaming at each other. People are yelling mean things to people. Roy McIlroy is a fucking professional adult. He can very clearly let that whole situation, if it plays out longer than it should, he's fully capable of gathering himself, restarting his pre-putt routine, and hitting a good putt and trying to make the best effort that he could. I think he, too, was using that to kind of light a fire a little bit. But Joey, by all accounts, huge fun of program, could not be more Team Joey. I, like I have Go to ahead, jump Frank. in here. I'm sorry, Dan, because I'm losing. I'm losing. I'm on 3% battery. The outlet situation in Europe is a fucking disaster. Oh, yeah. It's a disaster. <laughs> it's a disaster. I'm running. It's a disaster. You can't charge your phone if your life depended on it out here if you're an American. So I'm on 2%. I got to tell you this. I love Joey LaCava. We play a lot of golf with Joey LaCava. He's had a fucking Tiger Woods. We will die for Joey LaCava. L- lunatic moment. Like when you see the fucking, when you see the minute and a half video, <laughs> I like, couldn't watch it anymore. Like I had to stop watching it because it's so, 
hard to watch, but he's doing everything he can at that point. He's just galvanizing the guys. He's one of the guys. We've seen Joey after a couple pops. He's an opinionated guy. He's a very fucking in your face, like, oh, no, like the Rangers are going to win the Stanley Cup. Like, he's that kind of guy. He's a Northeast Connecticut guy. He's always going to have that fire. I love Joey LaCava. I saw some people, you know, in the media world being like he should be banned but for, for the Ryder Cup. For the, it's like, what are you talking about? This is what we needed. It's the juice that we needed. I love Joey LaCava. Guys, I got to go to my honeymoon, and I also have to hit end, or else you guys are not going to get any of my stuff here. So... I'm going to see, I, I say ciao, ciao, Abella, and uh, I think that's it. I'm going to go do Italian shit for the next fucking two weeks, and I think that's just Amazing. Like, Enjoy it, Abella. Oh, Enjoy it. Have fun. Have fun. I, was, I was standing on the right side of the 18th green uh, when the Bye-bye. whole thing went down, and Bye, in Frankie. real time, it was a ridiculous ridiculous move by joe lacava you could everyone in the crowd was everyone <laughs> off to the side was like what is he doing the he steps full it's one thing if you're waving your hat the other caddy waved his hat too. john ellis caddy for wyndham clark and then he stopped and moved away joe walked to the middle of the green and did it and then when rory says something to him he takes a step toward rory like there was a moment in his head like i'm gonna hit rory McIlroy." like that that flashed into his head <laughs> for a minute there um it was not a banner week for golf journalism because Todd Lewis on Golf Channel comes out with a report this morning that says, uh, you know, Joe texted Rory last night and wanted to bury the hatchet. They buried the hatchet. It's all good. We asked Rory after the round. He goes, I haven't spoken to Joe. He goes, I haven't spoken to Joe. So I don't know what's going on in these streets, man. It's like I leave the journalism world and everything goes to shit. It, it's funny just knowing Joe a little bit, just how he's because there's the picture of him standing and everyone from Team Europe is around him. It looks like the the Battle of the Bastards, Jon Snow, like when he's pulling out the the sword and everybody's coming at him. Just Joe's definitely just just like what what I do? I, what what do you mean? And he definitely clapped at Rory and like made a thing of it. It is funny to think about Rory those comments from years ago where he was like, eh, "It doesn't mean that we're Ryder Cup exhibition, not going to be fist pumping." And then smash cut to twenty twenty three, Shane Lowry and Rory's wife are pulling him into a car because he's yelling at Joey and Bones like it's. Once you're in that mix, it's just everything goes out the window. But yeah, Joe maybe was in the wrong. But again, I'm a Joy LaCava guy. I'm going to back him. I'm going to die for him. And I'm not even saying he was in the wrong. I feel like sometimes we're maybe we're leaning. He was a little inappropriate with that. Whatever, dude. It brought the juice and everybody loved it. He was, but also, like I said, it, it, it was so Scared overcomable. The like <laughs> it was. <laughs> Frankie's in dad's background. Yeah, he is. <laughs> He's got juice again. He, uh, it, it was that moment for Rory is so overcomable where, okay, Joey was standing there for way too long. So wait yeah. a fucking minute and then go through your routine. Like, it's not that big of a deal. That was what was driving me crazy. Was it awkward? Was it weird? Was it inappropriate? Yes. Guess what, dude? Joe LaCava felt the moment. He felt that the momentum was going to turn. He felt that U.S. had a little bit of a spark. He overreacted. He was a little bit inappropriate. He was a little bit in the wrong. In hockey, we used to do, like, we'd be down 5-1 with six minutes left of the third period, and we would say, all right, next time we have an odd man rush down the other way, you just chip that puck near the net, and I'm going to fucking run their goalie. Is that appropriate? Is that like, no, but we're playing these guys in 10 days. They're going to win this game. Let's send a message. Let's get people fucking riled up. Like, yeah, that's not good etiquette. You're not trying to hurt the guy, but you're going to fucking ding him. You're going to hit him pretty hard. You don't want to bury somebody behind him in the boards and break their neck. But if you can rough up their goalie a little bit who never gets hit and you're going to start a scuffle, people are going to go nuts. There's going to be a couple punches thrown. Like, let's fucking go here. Like, we got we to gotta find something, and that's just part of sports. And fucking Joey gets that. Yeah, he lost his mind a little bit. He looked like a crazy person just standing there yelling at Rory McIlroy. Well, Rory had, like, the biggest butt of the week so far coming up. He looked like a crazy person. But like I said, that it's the Ryder Cup. If that's the 18th grade of the Masters, ban him from Augusta. Fine. That's totally fair. It's the fucking Ryder Cup. It's chaos out there. Rory's clapping back at him. Like I, I think Rory had all of the ability in the world to just regroup, go walk over to the edge of the green, look off the other way, gather yourself, and make the best effort you can at a putt that he's he makes 4% of the time anyway. So it's not like it's some fucking huge six-footer that he missed because of Joe LaCava. So I get it. Yes, he was definitely in the wrong for sure. But in the grand scope of things, I think he was in the right. I think he saved the Ryder Cup. There was nothing to talk about. There was no juice at all. And then last night, everybody's like, 
U.S. has the momentum. They've lit a fire. They're down five points going into today. I mean, we're insurmountable. It's over. And everyone's like, we're kind of back. We got a little bit of a Ryder Cup here. So Joey, by all accounts, fucking great movie. Pissed off like the golf purist traditionalist who can't just figure out that like, yeah, he was in the wrong in the moment. He's probably going to apologize. He'll probably in the future be like, yeah, that was a tough moment for me. I looked a little ridiculous, but you know what? I stood by my guy. Shout out to Patrick Cantlay afterwards. who was interviewed and he just immediately said like, my guy's the best. That's all I'm going to say on that. So that's just what you want to see. That was beautiful. How, how about Patrick Cantlay said afterwards, they asked him about it. He goes, I'm, I uh, I was too busy letting out the emotion. I didn't see it. And then you saw the one minute and 30 second clip and he's literally staring at it the entire <laughs> time. I posted a screenshot. I, I don't know if Bush, you can put this on the YouTube. He's yeah. literally watching the entire thing unfold right in front of his eyes. Joe Lakov is a guy who's been in a bar fight or two. I mean, that that wrist flick, get the yeah. fuck. He goes, he looks at Shane Lowry and goes, shut the fuck up, Shane. He goes, shut the fuck up. It's I mean, <laughs> it, it was it was a, a, yeah. a totally surreal scene. I can't but I can't believe he did it. You you spend a decade on Tiger Woods' bag and you avoid anything like this, which is crazy. That's the hardest caddy job in the world, right? Steve Williams was kicking over fucking cameras. Even Bryson's caddy gets in the mix. Joe mostly stayed out of it. Everyone thinks of Joe LaCava as like, you know, a nice, happy guy. And then he gets on Cantley's bag earlier this year and just dives into the mud. You should not have to worry when you are buying tickets to your next big event. I talked about it on the last show a little bit, but went to Lambo last weekend for the first time. It was so insanely easy using game time to get these tickets popped on there. I believe it was like Saturday evening, having a couple of drinks to finish off a golf trip with some fellows. We were at Sand Valley. We're in Wisconsin, pulled up the game time app. Like two minutes later, we just had four tickets. We were at Lambo. They just boom, couple taps, amazing price sent right to your email game time. Nobody does it better than game time. This week, I am going to see a little singer-songwriter by the name of John Mayer at Madison Ooh. Square Garden. He's got two nights at the Garden. I'm definitely going to one. I might go to both, but I'll tell you what. I'm using game time when I go because it's going to be – I'm just that's right by our office. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to go on game time, and I'm going to say, I want to go see John Mayer at Madison Square Garden. And guess what? Game time is going to have the best, lowest price options that I can find, and I cannot wait. True or false? Did you not go to John Mayer alone one time? True. I did in New Jersey. I forget what part of New Jersey. I had a beautiful amphitheater. Uh, that was right when I moved to New York. So, And I've seen him a couple times at Madison Square Garden since I've been around New York City. So, yeah, no, John Mayer is is the guy, and I cannot wait to see him. Has he is he over getting the the heat from the Swifties uh, recently? Is he still kind of in the mud a little bit? I don't. I think he. I don't think he's in it as much. And I, you know, you'd have to yeah. ask uh, resident Swifty Alex Bush if that's true. But he, mm -hmm. they've kind of like kind of gone their separate ways. And he's just. I mean, he has an incredibly successful career. He was just. He was with Dead and Company forever. Now he's on this solo acoustic tour. So I, I, I genuinely don't know, but I know he was in their um, sights for there for a while. He's amazing. I know oh. that. Uh, you could take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. You just download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code four for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code four for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, uh, lowest price guaranteed. Bush, what is the status? Is he is is Mr. Mayor in the clear? It's kind of it's kind of old news. It just kind of came back up because uh, yeah. speak now Taylor's version came out. So. That's right. And because Kelsey was wearing a John Mayer shirt like two months ago, right? <clears throat> mm, that's right. I, you're right. You're right. You're right. Alex but Bush yeah, is locked in on the Bills game. You know, he's, uh, he's not paying attention. Uh, yeah, he is. All right. That's fine, Bush. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Game time. Go use the code four for $20 off right now. I'm looking at John Rahm while well, they're all celebrating Team Europe, but he's got the, he's got a Spanish flag wrapped around him like a towel. He, he's that guy. <laughs> he's just, and fucking. You know, you never, you don't want to, it's, you don't want to compliment guys when they're on Team Europe because you, you feel so Team USA. But John Rahm giving that interview being like, um, you know, I've been crying in the room when they've been playing clips of Sevy. And every time you put a microphone in front of John Rahm, he says something where I'm like, that wasn't a waste. Some guys you put a mic in front of them and you're like, that was a waste. John Rahm, it's never that way. He is always, Johnson, he has something a to say and that you want to hear. And I was, I was really, I'm always impressed by him. I think John Rahm is a top three guy for me in the world of golf at this point. Like he is so raw 
and real and also at that top upper echelon of top three, five guys when it comes to talent, skill, the whole deal. That fucking guy, I love him. I completely agree with you, Trent. When he speaks, he's very thoughtful. He's clearly not just trying to get through an interview. I think he's honestly trying to give a, a raw, real, legitimate, thoughtful answer. Uh, and it is. It's hard to compliment people because it's – but, you know, I mean, look at these guys. It's also – I think it's it's underrated somehow how hard it is to just win on – the road like golf is a fucking game of confidence man and when you're out there and every shot that you hit that's bad you get booed and you got thousands of people rooting against you and when you hit a great shot you get nothing and then the other team when they hit a pretty decent shot they get a giant roar they get a boost of confidence they feel supported and over fucking three days of matches five sessions like it just matters look at the records look at look at sports i just looked it up like about 60% of the time in the NFL and the NHL, the home team just wins. Like, there's just an advantage to being at home and playing in front of your home crowd. It just matters. Momentum matters. And going over there, it's like if the European team is really goddamn good, which they are, they've got, I would say, the top three players in the world right now. Like, clearly, Scotty is ranked number one, but he's struggling with the putter. Uh, he's not as good as he can be. I'm sure he'll get over that pretty quickly. But with Rom, Hovland, and Rory, these fucking guys, like, they're on home soil. They have the best players in the world. Yes, they fall off at the end. They got two guys ranked fucking 80-something or whatever, whereas, like, Bobby Mack looked like one of us in the Reiter Cup out there trying to play <laughs> under that pressure. But, like, overall, I mean, Team Europe is fucking – they're just a – they're a problem. And we didn't – you know, it, the other thing is, like, going to Bethpage, everyone's talking, like, get me to Bethpage. Remembering how far away – and how different everything has shaped up from two years ago at Whistling Straits to now, you have to remind yourself that like things are going to shape up so much differently between now and Bethpage. The teams will look different. The landscape will look different. The PIF might be in charge of one giant league where everybody's playing under league. We don't have any idea what it's going to look like when this thing comes to Bethpage, but you're thinking right now, like, oh, we're just going to have fucking Cantlay and Joe LaCava versus Rory right back when we go, and it's like, those two guys might be on the Majestics together by the time we get to fucking Bethpage. Like, nobody <laughs> fucking knows what's going to happen, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, Liv wasn't even a thing at this event two years ago. Um, yeah, no, it's it's crazy how fast things move, and, and it's crazy just how much the momentum shifts in match play. I love match play. Just love match play. Got to get more of more of it in golf. Let's hope that you know the Saudis insist on some sort of team competition because seeing these guys go head to head, it's just it turns the first hole into a you know an electric factory. When in a stroke play tournament, you, you don't you know you can kind of tune out until the back nine, but uh, with match play, you, you're you're at it right away. Speaking of John Rahm, remember the Brooks Kepka thing was that was the story. That was the spicy story of the week until Hackate came around was Brooks calling John Rahm a child. And, you know, you were talking about how good he is at the podium. The British press, by the way, I got to give the British press some credit. These guys don't come to PGA Tour events. They don't have like even try to build relationships with these guys. So they just ask the fucking question 20 times in a row trying to get their answer so he must have been asked 30 times like did that piss you off that he called you a child like yeah but yeah but he called you a child like how did that make you feel yeah so like when he called you a child did that add some motivation they asked it like four times and he just refused to give them any bulletin board material he said look he's entitled to his opinion blah 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 i would love for there to be a brooks versus rom rivalry i would i would love that after the masters you know rom uh, got him there rom got him again i it doesn't seem like there was any animosity before, but I think there probably is a little bit of bad blood now because, like, you're really going to call a guy a child after that? Like, after, he, you know, it's such an incredible finish to a match. You've just – anyone knows when, when you have a great match against someone and you come off the golf course, especially when you tie, you're like best friends. You're like, oh, what an incredible experience the two of us have. So to go sour grapes that quickly I thought was a really poor look by Brooks. I So this event almost made me look at Brooks in a different way. And and it's actually a positive because you the way you gotta look at Brooks is the way that I'm looking at him now as an he's the alpha. Like he just kinda is. That's kinda how his whole thing is like, I'm an alpha, I'm gonna win five majors when nobody thinks I'm gonna win any of these things. John Rom, the alpha of Team Europe, and Brooks was just trying to fucking get at him. I it was very bizarre. I will like first of all, for the first twelve hours, nobody knew what he was talking about. People were trying to pull clips from LACC being like, is this what this guy's talking about? And then it finally came out that I guess he punched some board. But Brooks, every time 
he says something. He did it to DJ a few years ago where he's like, that guy's only got one. Like he's always looking for the other, al- the other alpha in the room and being like, I'm going to try and bring that guy down a little bit. And if you view Brooks through that lens, he, it actually starts to make a little bit more sense. He is it's just a, a fucking gorilla. John Rahm is a fucking gorilla. They're the two biggest gorillas on, on each team. And Kepka's like, I'm going to try and fuck the fuck over that alpha. That's all he's trying to do in every press conference. Yeah. I think that's right. I think like if if Magic Johnson said, you know, yeah, Larry Bird acts like a fucking child. I could go pout after I missed the, you know, uh, jump shot to win the game. Like nobody would care. They, they did that every day, literally every day, every game, every match, every battle, every whatever the fuck. But here it's like in golf, people freak out about it, and we're 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 clamoring. We're looking for a story because U.S. was down a trillion after day one, and I, I agree with Trey. I think like that's just Brooks being Brooks, man. If this would have happened. Seven years ago, I think we would have been like, what did that guy say? But Brooks, he says this stuff. He said the same thing going into the final round uh, when Morikawa won the PGA at Harding Park where he was like, oh, yeah, that guy's only won one major talking about DJ. Like, he tries to get under people's skin. He plays the game a little bit, which I enjoy. It gives us some fodder. I don't – like, he doesn't He doesn't quite come off the right way, I feel like, and so he gets a lot of shit from people. But in in the grand scope of things, I think that you're kind of like, hey, he's trying to find something. It was a little bit like the LaCava situation, a little bit like waving the hats. Like, you got to find something. MJ talked about it, about just basically making up stories in his head about people wronging him and saying mean shit to him, and then he would light a fighter and go fucking score 50 points. So you got to try to find something in the Ryder Cup in a, you know, a different environment when you're on the road, and, and you know, he was fucking trying. He was trying. Yeah, let me be clear. Like, I, I'm very happy that it happened. I'm very happy also that the Joe LaCava thing happened. I think two things can be true at once. We can say that guy was wrong, but we're in the content business. We're in the entertainment business. This oh, tournament dude. would have been way, way, way more boring without those two things happening. Yeah, I mean, 100%. 100%. Um, I uh, I just got a text from uh, Kirk Minahan called me, and then I didn't pick it up. I said, we're recording the pod. And he just goes, shoot Ricky Fowler to Neptune. He should be permanently <laughs> banned from all the PGA events. <laughs> I, you know, I, that was the maybe the most stunning part of the whole weekend. And, and I know maybe he didn't know what was going on, but it was just like, make him put it, man. Make him put it. I will say, if we're talking captains, th- this captains duo of Luke Donald and Zach Johnson, uh, just, and I think Rory said it when, when I, somebody asked him, like, what's that Team Europe team room been like? And what's Luke Donald been like? And he was like, a quiet confidence is what I would say about Luke Donald. And it's like, we've yeah. got two two captains who just, there's no fire. There's no nothing. And like, if the the team USA guys would be saying that about Zach, if they had won and there'd be a question about Luke Donald, like, is he inspiring enough? Like what's wrong with this guy? Like, I don't understand. It's the winning team really gets to write the history books. That's never been more true than in the Ryder cup. And Luke Donald just happened to win. But he also, when I watch him, I'm just like, ah, there's just not much there. His post winning press conference was pretty good. Or, or the post round interview where he was crying and being like, this is the greatest accomplishment of my career. But you, you need captains with mo- more fire. Henrik Stenson would have had a lot of fire, I'd imagine. Yeah, I think, too, the biggest thing that Luke had over Zach, they're both pretty bland and quiet, quiet, confident, shot, yeah, is, like, he just came off more polished. And, like, Definitely. when he... When he went on for a minute during his opening ceremony speech in like perfect Italian, you know, it was a little bit like, oh, we might be in trouble here. Like this guy, he's that's like prepared, polished and just not right. Like he wasn't bringing the thunder in interviews, but he also wasn't making you cringe and want to turn off your fucking TV and throw it off the balcony. You know, it was like where Zach Johnson, it was <laughs> when they would put a microphone in front of him. You're like, oh, no. Oh, here we go. Well, listen, like, God damn Zach it. has the Zach has the demeanor of a guy because I've been following this guy forever. So I he has the demeanor of a guy that works when you're winning, like because he's a little just like, oh, yeah, we're winning. We're, we're up. now. No, we're up for nothing. And this is going. I mean, I'm just letting my I'm letting my dogs hunt. That's I'm letting them go. I'm letting them do it. But when you're down for nothing, you having that like a little bit of like shy kind of like you can't shrug your shoulders and smile. And that's what he wants to do. That's where I, that's what I do when I get uncomfortable. I just shrug my shoulders and I smile. And that's what he does. But when you're on such a big stage and everyone is hanging on your every word and they're looking for they're looking for motivation or they're looking for something and and they put the mic in your face and you're down oh four and you're just like ha, ha, i don't i don't know you know it's kind of crazy that demeanor does not work when you're getting fucking pounded it doesn't no dude it really does not and it, you're right Trent. where it's like it's almost after like a massive tragedy and everyone's got like they're just they're they're disoriented and everyone's talking with everyone about how 
where are we going to get answers? What a disaster this is. And then like the world leader, the president stands up and everybody's quiet. And they're like, all right, we're finally going to get some answers. Let's look to our leader here. And that's like, everyone's going nuts on social of like, this is a train wreck. We're getting steamrolled by Europe. Our best players are on the bench that have won majors. We're a nightmare. Here's our guy. Okay. He's going to give us some answers. What is it? And Zach Johnson's like, I'm really proud of my guys out there. I, I guess is pretty, you know, that's a tough course. <laughs> You're like, what the fuck did he say? Yeah, it's one like, of one of the journalists, one of the journalists uh, at the at the press conference goes, Zach, you say you're proud of your team. I'm looking at the scoreboard behind you, and we're trying to figure out what you're proud of. <laughs> like that's that's kind of. That's, I want to. I also I want to say a word a about question. the Italian language. Do you I think, remember that one? I Should mean, he have just the most oh, insane language? Like even more. In per, like I, this is my first time spending like you know I, I couldn't and, and the Italians aren't um, it's not a hugely popular sport here so most of the European fans I think were from other countries there's a lot of English a lot of Irish a lot of Scottish it's obviously easy to come to Italy from those countries they love golf uh, Italy's a great place to vacation the the few Italians who were in the crowd they just were they when a, when a golf shot was struck perfectly the the passion that oozed out of them, they all go, bella, bella, bella. When a ball is like flying toward the crowd, it was just fucking awesome. <laughs> Let me put something to you guys, and I'll do it to Riggs because Danny Rapp's uh, internet is a little shaky. But all right, so you're the, you're the captain of the Ryder Cup, Sam Riggs Bazoin. You're the captain. Your Thank team you. just got swept in the opening sessions. What do you say? I'm, basically, what I'm asking is, what could Zach have said after that fucking molly whopping? to the to the microphone that would have made people feel better do you bury your guys do you say they played like shit they they just didn't play well enough to win these matches i i'm just wondering because i'm i'm basically zach johnson we're from literally the exact same place so in my head i would have done what he did where i'm just like ah, you know i'm proud of these guys they made the flight over that jet lag boy that's tough huh but what do you say that's gonna let pe not let people fucking bury you for what you said you know i think that what frustrated me in those moments was this sort of approach and demeanor that he had like what happened didn't matter and that no no we're staying the course whereas what i what i would have liked to have heard him say or what i would have said in that moment is take some ownership because they're kind of like hey you lost four nothing you had two multiple major winners on the bench that you flew over here that you picked what are you doing and i would have liked to have him say you know what Looking at that, we lost four nothing. Of course, I'm second guessing some of my decisions right now. We got some unbelievably talented guys out there. Maybe should have had them in this morning, but I did trust the guys that I had. So yeah, it's a tough job. We're gonna try to rally here this afternoon. Take a little bit of like ownership of like, yeah, clearly, I, I'm not proud of what happened. Instead of being like, oh, we got a system, we're fine here. Uh, I'm really proud of my team, you know. And it was it was just weird. It felt like a weird reaction. It felt dishonest. It felt like, dude, there's no way that you that way like there's no human could feel that way you have to be walking around like it, it, on that back nine on friday morning right we talk about all the build up for the whole week for years for two years of build up zach johnson had to be walking around that back nine mentally really being like what oh the yeah fuck just happened i just like jesus we got all this prep all this data i got my guys he's probably getting text messages from tiger for months leading up to it everybody's ready to rock we're coming off a historic 19 to 9 win and we're getting molly whopped like he had to be mentally reeling and then he gives kind of a uh i thought like it just came off as a dishonest reaction in the media of like Oh, we got a great system. My guys are really good. You know, we got a great team. I'm really proud of this effort. You're just kind of like, what the fuck are you talking about? Whereas again, I would have liked to see him go up there, I guess, take some ownership, be like, hey, woo, that was a disaster. We're going to circle up. We're going to try to circle the wagons. We got to find some momentum here. You know, like I, I would have liked something more along those lines. Ownership is a better angle for sure. That's I a better angle. Just say like, we got it. We got our ass kicked. We have to, we have to adjust. You know, I just, I think Zach Johnson, and I said this in our, our, our podcast leading up to the week. I, I just think, and, and his comments afterwards support this, I just think this was the honor of his life. And so I think he was just on cloud nine throughout the entire process. I, like he couldn't, he couldn't believe that his career had led him to this moment. Whereas I feel like if you get a guy like Tiger Woods, he'd be like, oh, these guys fucking suck. But Zach is such a nice guy. He's from Iowa that he was just never going to be the guy who was going to light everybody up and try and, that's just like not his leadership style.
You also feel if you're him that you're walking. I mean, this is a team that just won 19 to nine at whistling straight. Yeah. like, you're like, Oh, I'm I, all I have to do is barely keep my hands on the wheel and just sort of move it a little bit. And we're going to, we're going to crush these guys. And it, it just didn't work out that way. Um, yeah, no, he's going to get crushed. And that's, that's, it's, it's going to hurt. Like as a guy who all I do is I say he won a masters and he won an, an open championship at old, old uh, the old course, like, then everyone's going to be like, well, remember Rome? And I'm going to be like, yeah. I don't know what to say to that. It's going to, that hurts. And family. also you're right. Cause that's really unfair for him that he's got that. It, it basically was like, you took a, you took the dream team and you went to Europe and got killed. What happened to you? But in reality, he lost 16 and a half to 11 and a half. The last Ryder cup in France, they lost 17 and a half to 10 and a half. The last or the last one before that in Scotland, they lost 16 and a half to 11 and a half before that they lost by one before that they lost by nine in Europe. So it's like that. These are the results he did. He pretty much did like the average performance that you, the, the, you know what I mean? That like the U.S. has done in Europe over the last decade or 12 years. So, so that part stinks, but you know, it's 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 almost reminds me a lot of of politics like the pendulum always just continues to swing and it's that way in politics forever it's like no one party has full control of everything for 40 years that just doesn't happen it's like maybe you get a president for eight years maybe even 12 years which is rare but guess what then the other party wins for four years eight years 12 years and it's the same fucking deal here it was like after 2000 17 president's cup like us won in 2016 at medine or at uh hazeltine then they had the dominant performance where it was over saturday night in the president's cup and you're thinking like this u.s team is gonna go on a rampage for the next 20 years where these guys are unbelievable then they get destroyed in 2018 and you're like oh my god it's a nightmare people are calling the new york times patrick reed jim furick worst captain like disaster and then you get the U.S. just 19 to 9 going into like a must win. And you're like, oh, they're going to dominate. And here we are again. Europe just dominates at home. So the pendulum, I think, will just unfortunately, as much as we want to conjecture and this and that, it'll probably just swing back and forth in the Ryder Cup until the day we die. Hello, everyone. I would like to talk to you about your weekend style. Our very good friends at Peter Millar are always looking to create innovative performance pieces that balance comfort and style, and their new Orion hoodie answers the call perfectly. I got to be honest with you. Peter Millar, when, I, when we first started seven years, eight years ago doing this podcast, doing golf, Peter Millar was largely, in my brain, most brains, like a pro shop brand, the best polos, the best golf pants, the best quarter zips, boom, over the last several years. They have just dominated obviously still in that regard that's their bread and butter but in the lifestyle stuff their hoodies their joggers oh. even their t-shirts their crew necks man if they just figured it out in the lifestyle stuff the, those lava wash hoodies i know we've been talking about cool. those forever but those are now they make lava wash joggers so it's the same material but just on your bottom half instead of the upper half. And it, you, you, I'll tell you what, you put on both, you almost can't put on both because you'll fall asleep. You'll put them on and you just fall asleep because it's, it's that comfortable. The, the lava wash stuff, but all of it, like you're saying, the lifestyle, the hoodies, all of it is so goddamn good. You know, Peter Millar, obviously, they're, uh, they're a big supporter of ours. So we have a ton of Peter Millar stuff. They send us a lot of the new stuff. They want us to showcase it, um, like the uh, Orion. Orion? Orion? What do you think this is? O-R-I-O-N. Is it Orion? Like Orion's Orion. belt? I think it's Orion. I would say Orion as well. Yeah. Orion hoodie answers the call. It's the full zip. It's amazing. You throw it on after a workout. You throw it on to go out to dinner. Uh, it's really, really, really good. But they also, I've got this uh, Peter Millar catalog that came. And I keep it just right there on my coffee table in my living room. And I just I just flip through that thing and I can't help but go to their website and be like, this stuff that they're making, we got falls appearing, foliage is coming in here. Oh, yeah. It's getting crisp. Even in Arizona, it's getting a little bit crisp here in the early mornings and at night. Uh, they just make the best stuff. So head on over to PeterMillar.com slash foreplay to explore the Orion and the rest of the Peter Millar line. That's PeterMillar.com slash foreplay. They got a great hub right there. They got a great link. It's got a bunch of our favorites, including the Orion full zip hoodie. So go over to PeterMillar.com slash foreplay.
I'm looking at a uh, Victor Hovland right now taking a picture with all of the wives and girlfriends from Team Europe because that's like kind of his thing now is showing Ooh. up to events solo, which I think is awesome because he gets the both the best oh, of yeah. both worlds. Because yeah. you better believe that Victor Hovland is fucking like it's not like it's not like this guy <laughs> is just you know he's by himself all the time, so he gets like the oh my god, Victor, you're such a good guy, and then he also probably is like banging Swedish models on the side. Um, I would like to ask you guys something because I saw a. A, uh, a piece by one of my old colleagues at Golf Digest that basically said the Ryder Cup is too predictable. It's the home team wins every time. Um, it, and it is true that the last couple have been blowouts. There, there does seem to be a moment in every Ryder Cup, no matter how big it is, where you're trying to convince yourself, oh, if they can flip this match, you know, there's actually a little bit of a chance. Do you guys think the Ryder Cup has like a home field advantage problem or is it kind of part of what makes the event so great? We, we, we are so dumb as people that we forget how much home field advantage matters and every year we convince ourselves that the Americans can do it on the road or is it an actual issue? The thing that's, that's really stinks about trying to answer that question is that it's such a small sample size. Like in, you know, if, if, if you were talking about the NBA, if they have a home field, you know, court, home court advantage problem, it's like you got 82 games played by 30 teams. It's a huge sample size every year. It's like, we get one Ryder cup every two years. There's been in the last 30 years, there's been 15 Ryder cups. It's like, if you start to get a little bit of an outlier trend, it looks like it's the dominant trend. Having said that, like, I think data has probably driven it to be more of a advantage than they would have ever imagined in 1927 when they whipped up this fucking thing. And Sam, Mr. Businessman Sam Ryder came up with this cool cup that he donated. But like it, or when you look at it, it's like the um, the Europeans were so dialed on the data that they set up the entire course down to the yardages to the point where they were better with the you know than the US from 180 to 220 yards it was mentioned on the broadcast a bunch and so they were able to kind of filter the play of the golf course to the point where Europe would have way more or b both teams would have way more shots from 180 to 220 than they would wedges because the US is better with wedges and when you get down to that kind of detail and you get to do the rough and the course setup and literally pick the goddamn golf course down to the yardages where you guys are better with, you know, long or mid irons than they are. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a bigger advantage. I think than people probably realize, even though we just talked about how much the crowd matters, which it definitely does, but like down to there's, there's not much in sports where you truly get like an actual rules or whatever advantage hockey. You get the last change. I know that in like, that's a little bit of a fact. You get to match up on on the home kind of however you want, but there's not a lot of sports where you truly get to like manufacture and create a strategic advantage by being the home team. And in the Ryder Cup, you do. You do almost need a third party to like. Obviously, it's going to switch venues like Europe, America, but you almost need a third party to deal with the details because taking the wedges out of the Americans' hands that was a such a gigantic deal. That I, again, like you're saying, I don't think people know how much control the home team has on what gets set. So I think you're right about that. There almost needs to be a third party because it was blatant this time around. And it's going to be blatant next time around, too, when it's in America. Yeah, I could get behind that. I could get behind, you know, obviously you're not going to the event. There's no chance in hell you would ever play it at a neutral site. I mean, that's just the, it's the stupidest idea ever, right? You no. have to have the home field advantage. But I can see a neutral setup. Um, kind of leveling the playing field a little bit. Like, I think back to Hazeltine in 2016, which was like the Americans had the length off the tee. They didn't hit it particularly straight, but they had the length off the tee. So they set it up where to clear all the bunkers, it was like 290 yards and there was rough all in front of the bunkers. And then over the bunkers, you were fine if you could just carry those bunkers. So guys like <laughs> JB Holmes and Phil Mickelson Amazing. could just fucking wail away. So I, I, I think I'm, that's, I gotta let that sit for a little bit, but I, I think I think I might be behind that. Just having the PGA of America and, and Ryder Cup Europe or whatever, like have have them set it up in a way where it doesn't necessarily uh, favor one team so so drastically over the other. Yeah, and the only way you'd be able to do it was you'd have to be like, okay, starting now in three Ryder Cups from now, we're gonna have a third party because you'd be like, all right, we'll let the U.S. get theirs, then we'll let Europe get one more, and then so in six years we're going to turn this over to a third party. You could pick the golf course, right? Like the PGA tour or PGA of America picks the course in the U S European tour picks it over there. You could pick the course and I can obviously pick a course that favors your guys more than the other. Totally fine. But like in terms of the setup, it's turned over to a third party and they claim, right? Like I started Paul McGinley actually talking about this a lot on live from where he was like, when I was captain, 
we had way more control than we have than we have now like throughout the week he's like we have full control still leading up to the week but by sunday or monday or whatever it is they in theory turn it over to like the superintendent who's supposed to be a third party person who's clearly not but like they're supposed to be and those guys set up the pin locations and like and everything from there but you know we spoke earlier in the week about how leading up to like luke donald you know changed the cut of the rough and such over the last couple of weeks because europe went out for their practice sessions two weeks ago changed it so they had pretty much full control until the 11th hour and i i do think that's probably a bigger uh that's probably a bigger advantage than, than people think um we got to hammer the coverage i mean the coverage was stunning the amount of commercials was borderline unwatchable i would say that if there's another Ryder cup in two years at beth page and there's not at least a premium option where you could just get rid of ads that'll be the greatest travesty of all time because it's un there's no sport in the fucking world could you imagine the super bowl where they just don't show plays like if they just missed plays you're watching the super bowl they go to commercial and the patriots got it and it's first and, tw and 10 on their own 20 they go to commercial they come back and it's like third and seven on the opponent's you know uh 12 yard line you'd be like what, what the fuck happened here and that's literally what happens in our biggest event that we wait two years to watch you just miss 90 percent of the fucking action and to make it even more infuriating, it appears to only be an American problem. Because when you're tweeting about it, everyone on the other side of the pond is like, I've seen every shot. They're all, I've seen too many shots on the other side of the pond. They're like, <laughs> Sky Sports is crushing the coverage. And, but we're watching it and you're up at fucking 2.45 in the morning. You're like, why am I awake? This is crazy. My body is, has no idea what's happening. But then you don't get to see any shots. How? Like, are they just so loaded with commercials? They want to make so much money. I get it. You guys want to make money. But if the other side is figuring it out, if there's somebody just across that big old body of water who can figure it out, then we can figure it out. I don't, that's the part I do not understand whatsoever. Yeah. So let's talk about money a little bit because that, that was the one part. Let's of talk about the, money. that was well, the one part of the report that was true. Um, this can't lay feel strongly that, that people should be p paid to play in the Ryder Cup. This has become huge business. You saw all those commercials. All that money is not flowing to the players, at least not directly. They do get, I think it's 200 grand to donate to a charity of their choice, um, but they're not getting a paycheck for this week. It's a, it's a sticky situation, right? Because on one hand, representing your country is the highest honor in sports, and these guys make so much money, and do they really need to be paid every week? On the other hand, it's like, I don't really know what it feels like to have an event that you know generates 100 million or whatever, however much money it is that's based on my talent and my work and I don't profit from it. You know, I, I think it's uh, where I land, I, I seem to gravitate toward is like playing in the Ryder Cup is the coolest thing in the world. They make plenty of money throughout the rest of the year, but it's, it's hard to tell someone like you don't deserve money for your work. Where do, what do you guys think? Pay them. It's the same thing as the college sports thing that we've been talking about for 30 years. Then they finally started paying them. Like I get that like people are going to get riled up because it's like you have the flag on your chest and you are representing the country, but it's also, it's a business. And this thing is making a shit ton of money. Like the, for years, the college football players, the college basketball players were like, it's, this is a billion dollar business we're talking about. And we don't get any of it, like none of it. And, and I think it's very similar to that. Again, people will be like, you know, can't they made 15 million. Everyone's making a bunch of money and everybody's rich. So it's a little different, but I honestly think if you had told me like, like, are you, did you get paid to be in the Ryder cup? I'd just be like, yes, like you should probably, I mean, there are, there's advertisements on this broadcast, so probably, yeah, they should. Yeah, I, I have no issue with paying them. Pay them. No. I, you know, I, I and I think to people's, I saw Luke Donald answer the question last night, and he said, absolutely not. You know, this is like such a prideful thing. Well, then where does the buck stop? Because if yes. their argument's going to be you're playing for your country, how could you possibly want to be paid? to be like, okay, fine. And then you're broadcasting it for your country or for Europe and America, so you don't you don't make any advertisements. And you, PGA of America, and you know the European Tour, you're putting this on for Europe, right? You're so patriotic over there in Europe. Then why are you selling hospitality? Why don't you just give it to people for free? Like what? Right. Where does the buck stop? And so to their point, it's like fine if everyone's going to make tons of money then why not just pay the players? It would be a small percentage. So I have no issue with that. I doubt they're going to want $10 million each to play. So I have no I have no issue whatsoever with them being like, right. why don't we get paid to play? The people who are arguing against it, I get the the angle of like, oh, it's it's an, a, it's a pride, it's a patriotism thing. But also you're arguing for these no-name, no no-face people who are making this money. They're just getting rich off this event. Like, 
Why are you arguing for them? That doesn't make any fucking sense. Right. And multiple things can be true at once. <clears throat> Sorry. Multiple things can be true at once, right? Like you could, you could be willing to, I mean, obviously Cantley was here and he was fired up about when he made his putts, like he's not going to not play. So you, and, and same thing with the college athletes, it's not like they didn't play. You can, you can have all that pride in representing your country and, and feel super honored and, and have all the emotion of playing with the flag on your chest and also want to be paid for your work. There was a, a pretty like a uh, open rumor or not even a rumor, but apparently Patrick Cantley was walking past uh, one of the PGA officials this week and they wanted him to stop for something a pga of america official and they wanted him to stop for something i don't know if it was a social video blah blah and he goes nope you guys he goes nope you're making more money than me this week and just keeps walking yeah yeah i i get that it's a tough look optics wise it's tough there's no sure. doubt about it to be like you're out here in this coolest event ever people would give their fucking right leg or their nuts to be able to play in this thing like you are and you're bitching that you want to be paid but i think it, it it's a very justifiable principle thing of like okay if nobody's getting paid anywhere and nobody's making any money on this thing great we're all doing it just for the love of country and for sport fine but that's just not fucking true people were making tons of money off of this thing tons they have commercialized the shit out of it and the entire product is patrick cantley and max homa and these guys so it's totally justifiable in my opinion at that point to want to be paid in the early days with this thing when they weren't making as much money and it wasn't as commercialized and whatnot i don't i could totally see people not really having an issue with it everybody's out there but man when you're letting it like when the gap is so massive that there's these these guys, these corporations, these companies, people are literally getting rich off of this week, and you're off your back. I could understand being upset about that. I, you know, and and to Dan's point, it's not like they're so upset that they're refusing to play. Like, right. they're still out there playing, caring a lot, as passionate as could be, carrying the goddamn torch last night. Uh, and then still on the side when asked, being like, yeah, in my opinion, we should probably be paid for this. Like, I don't think that's that big of an issue. How do yeah, you think it's like the, the Masters golf pays audience people? feels the about Patrick people. Kelly? Oh, go ahead. No, I'm saying the Masters pays people. It's like, you know, the, uh, the what I was saying before, it's like you, you can want a, something and something can have importance and you still want to be compensated. Um, I think the general American public is very jealous that these guys get to play golf for a living and make $15 million and have zero sympathy for the whole, like, this is my, I deserve this because it's my work. Like I think overall, Patrick Cantlay had a pretty good week. Yeah, it was, and it was, I, but um, I don't know if I I'm confident. He, he in that handled opinion. it. He handled it beautifully. He handled it beautifully with the fans too. He like had fun with them. They were tipping their caps to him. He was laughing. He, I think he definitely like the initial thing. Shock was not good, but I think he. I think in the way he played, you know, winning solves everything. It flipped yesterday. I mean, he yeah. was the least popular person on the internet. It, you know, and and and. It was a culmination of things. It was like the slow play stuff. Some of the answers he's had in interviews over the last couple of years, very unlikable person in a lot of ways. And then all of a sudden, extremely unlikable yesterday when that report was going around. And then when you make a bunch of putts and you become the fucking guy and you become Captain America, and then in your interview at the end, you're like, yeah, my hat just doesn't fit. That's why I didn't wear it. Boom. He just became the guy. So, I, yeah, I think his stock. 24 hours ago his stock was shit now or, or 19 hours ago now i think his stock is really fucking high very patrick reed like but the the difference yeah. is is that Cantley is incredibly quiet like i'd say his main gear is silence and that's kind of how he goes about things patrick reed is not necessarily that way although he's actually a little bit more on the quiet side too but like though the, there's parallels between the two of them and I, I i love polarizing guys like that and i i don't think it's going to carry over for Cantley in terms of like no. Next year on the PJ Tour, he's not going to be a fucking spark plug because he's bitching about this and that. That's where Patrick Reed was a different beast, where he would bitch all the time about everything, no matter where he was. Cantlay, is, is, I think the spotlight's on him this week, and then this next year, he's just going to People will remember back. this, though. I think people will remember this, though. I, like, so. I felt like I felt like that stuck with Patrick Reed, even when he was the least likable guy ever. I still feel like there was always a part of you as a fan that was like, yeah, but he's our guy in the Ryder Cup. You know, like that was always kind of in there and eventually it got to the point where it was all too overwhelming but even in like 2017 and those types of in-between years before he went full 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 heel like he was the guy that partnered up with jordan spieth and he made big shots at the Ryder cup and you're like yeah he's he's the worst but like he's our guy and that and i still i think that'll stick with Cantley a little bit and like you said he's pretty quiet so as long as he doesn't like i don't i don't know that he'll be able to do enough things that will overcome us being like Remember that fucking Saturday at the Ryder Cup? That guy's awesome. He needs to do the thing where he like his putter head cover is an American Ryder Cup putter yep. cover or like the driver head cover. Because I think 
what did what did Patrick Reed did he he had something in his bag that was Team USA and every time you saw him you're like oh yeah did I he, remember that I think he had the uh, scorecard the letter scorecard holder I think it was like he always had the USA one and then didn't he in final rounds too he would just wear red white and blue like like when he would <laughs> I think he did that's that. what you need you need little little breadcrumbs that'll lead people back to like oh yeah he's but he's good in the Ryder Cup we like him when he's playing for Team USA that's what he's got to do he should just put like a little American flag on like every pair of pants that he wears or something and and we'd all be like that's our guy that's like, I hate him but he's our guy <laughs> Well, yeah, instead he'll go back to wearing a hat that has literally Goldman Sachs on it. Like He doesn't do himself any favors with that sponsorship. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. He has that, right? Yeah, like he basically has like villains. I'm I'm paid by villains on his fucking hat and on his shirt. Uh, so we'll see. For us, golf is quite simple. We're out there to escape. We're out there to have a great time. It's a big part of our brand, our our show everything we've talked about when you're out there yeah you want to compete but guess what you're not playing in the Ryder cup you're not playing in the masters you're playing with your buddies fireball fireball is just going to make it better when you find yourself stressing we all do what you're stressing you're frustrated you finally got all the way out there you paid for your tea time you took an uber you drove out there and here you are you want to have a good time you're not playing your best don't worry about it because fireball whiskey is there to help you say fuck it free your fire it's all about helping you push away all the little annoying parts of golf or whatever else is going on in life and have yourself a good time. We love fireball whiskey. Yeah, you got to do what you need to do to have a good time out there because some people are stressed out there. They're not playing well. And it's like, dude, it doesn't matter. Drink one of these fireballs. Let's have a good time. A couple holes later, let's drink another one. And then before you know it, you're having the best day of your life. And that's what it's about out there. Don't stress about your score. Don't stress about making birdies or even pars. Drink a couple fireballs and have fun with your friends. That's what it's about. Fireball is the birdie shot of golf, and it's the number one shot in the USA. The Fireball 50 milliliter shooters are the perfect shot for the golf course. Throw a bunch in your bag, and they're ready to go whenever you need them. Plus, no shot glass or chaser needed. You just crack it, knock it back. You can toss it right out there. Easy. So if you're really feeling like upping the ante on the course this week, this next coming weekend, make sure to grab a 10-pack of Fireball shooters. What a Ryder Cup. What a what a a saved Ryder Cup, I would say. This thing had the ability to be a major dud, a major, major dud with the coverage, the absolute sweep, the blowout, the low energy, both captains, and there was a big jolt of energy and a lot to talk about. So uh I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the hell. I out just of saw it. one I just saw one quote come out from JT that said, usually there are a couple of misfits, but this team was one. Obviously asked about like what was going on in the team room. That makes me feel good about uh, Zach Johnson's legacy. They're not going to bust. Well, how, how I about, think. I think that, yeah. I feel, I feel good too, because I tweeted right away that like, this is bullshit. And so I feel like I got to take a little bit of a victory lap because Jamie how? Weir's report Damn. was just like so crazy. How? All right. So, and I, I don't know what we're going to do with the rest of this podcast because we still got to watch the press conferences and all that. But like, as a journalist, how does how does Jamie Weir or um, whoever had the other report, how do they feel confident enough to take that shit wide? Because that Jamie Weir stuff, ha having there be zero validity and then also zero validity on the other story, like that feels like a huge risk. I, I just don't understand it. Yeah, there's there's no science to it, right? Like we all hear rumors all the time. I mean, I just think back to to the live stuff when it was like this guy's going, this guy's signing. I remember some guy walked up to me uh, at the U.S. Open at Brookline and was like, I heard Fitz is going to live. And I literally had a conversation with him the night before where he goes, yeah, my dad told me he would disown me if I go. Like, there's zero percent chance I go. So there's always there's always like things that are flying around. And it's it's an inexact science or really an art sort of of trying to who do you trust and how many people have you heard that that say it? The thing that's so crazy about the the locker room report, there, there are so many guys, even if it was true, which it's not, even if it was true, the U.S. was going to come out and shit on that report no matter what. So you're really putting yourself out there. Secondly, if you're going to report something like that, there are so many eyewitnesses who can just be like, that's not true. The craziest part was the, was the, the locker room saying that they're in some different part of the locker. Like, could you imagine if that was actually happening? Like, do you, do you think that Justin Thomas would <laughs> right. have been like, yeah, like, team's great except for these two fucking pricks want to be paid so badly that they're not <laughs> hanging out with the team? And then the gala thing, you know, saying he refused to go to the gala. He took pictures on the Spanish, Spanish steps with the team. That's the only public part of the gala. So if you're not going to go to something, you don't go to the pictures. 
he went to the pictures and then went home because like he wasn't sleeping well or so. so it was just it was just very 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 bizarre and i think it's you know especially in this day and age where it's like you do get like he got i'm sure jamie weir got like a ton of followers from it and i'm sure he got like a ton of juice right when it happened and so you're you're weighing you know you you want to have that scoop it's an electric feeling when you break something and everyone's following you and everyone's quote tweeting you um but then it can break bad so there's really no clean answer to it and it's one of the one of the tougher things about the job yeah it's you know i the only explanation for me is he's skip skip bayless you know he doesn't care right and like he's just looking for the juice he's looking for what you just explained and whether it's true or not it doesn't matter and there's an element of like as long as you think you can weasel your way into defending it, then like put it out there, <laughs> you know, like if you don't, if you truly don't care right now, like we're not in that business. We don't really like break stuff. And when we do, it's like, we know it's rock solid because we break stuff once every three years in terms of like me, Trent Frankie, that crowd. But like, otherwise <clears throat> y- y- you put everything you put, you put out there is like sarcastic for us for the most part. When you're trying to paint yourself as like a journalist and you put something out there, you like you got to be right right like you can't be wrong and you can't be wildly like publicly wrong unless you're going kind of heel mode and you're just looking for action yeah i don't know enough about jamie weir i don't know what his like what his view on the current state of journalism in 2023 is but it's a good question because i remember that i remember like i remember with stephen a smith when he was a writer for like the los angeles times and i was like oh this guy's a good basketball writer and i would read his pieces every once in a while and then it's you you like find out about a guy and then you like start to see him do these talk shows and you're like what's what is, what's happening what's happening right yeah. now i don't i thought this was like the guy who wrote really thoughtful nba pieces for the la times and then once you realize like what it is it's more fun because it's like oh uh, this guy is like it's pro wrestling to them right yeah it, it, it's a it's an interesting one because w- with social media and with all these athletes having direct access to quote unquote the media right they can get their message out right away like the scoop game and this is something that i was kind of running into at the end of my time with golf digest it's, it's just like they, they don't that 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 it's hard to make that your 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 chief thing Right. Like it's hard to be like, all right, I'm yeah. the scoop guy, unless you're like Adam Schefter or you're Adrian Wojnarowski, where there's different GMs and there's a league structure. But it's it's different in golf when that doesn't I mean, it happened a little bit last year with Liv. It's just hard to make that your your thing. And so I naturally, if I feel like I've become more of like do more commentary because the the it's just so easy for them to respond and be like, this is bullshit, you know, right. and it's like and whether it is bullshit or it's not bullshit, like a journalist tweets something versus a player tweets something and the pl- the public is always going to believe the player and dunk on the journalist. You're right. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of like half or not 75% truths that I feel like are involved. Right. And with the Jamie weird thing, it's like Patrick Cantlay wants to be paid and therefore he's not wearing a hat and the team room is fractured. And he could be like, well, he, if people are like your report is bullshit, he's like, no, he does want to be paid. So then he's clinging to like his report was true. And he's like, and he's not wearing a hat. That's true. And to be like, well, no team ever has declared that their, their team room is fractured. Like I heard that this guy disagrees with this play. Of course they're fractured. And now he's in a world where he's like justifying and, and not doing the worst job ever of being like, no, my report was true. Even though we're all like, yeah, but that's not true. Like, yeah, he might want to be paid, but it doesn't have anything to do with like the room being fractured, not sitting on different sides of the room. Like, what do you, maybe their, their chairs happen to be on the left side and the rest are on the right side because the fucking architect built the room that way. Like, what do you, like, so there's parts of it, right? That are like, he's, he's going to claim forever that his report was true and everyone else will claim that it wasn't. And then now you're just in this fucking weird, shitty world. So Paul Azinger knew from the jump. I got to give Paul Azinger credit. He He's the he best, did. dude. He is so just like, <laughs> keep it in the locker room. Nobody fucking, no leaks in the boat. And <laughs> as soon as Dan Hicks brought up that report, he, he, Azinger wouldn't even let him get through it. He was like, this is rubbish. This is absolute, this f- clickbait. It's fake news. It's not real. Th- at a time when no one had any idea what was true and what was false, Azinger was full bore the other way, just like, Nope. You know, people are always looking for a story. They're always looking for something to write about, trying to get those clicks. He ended up being right. So shout out to Paul Easinger. I know people, some people don't like him, but I love that guy. Yeah, he was all, he sniffed that out. He sniffed that out as fast as he possibly could. I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. It was just a, it was a shit week for journalism in general. I mean, we had the, the reports were just wrong. The report we talked about yesterday was obviously wrong. And then today, when the whole going around all morning on the coverage was that Joe LaCava class act reached out to Rory and cleared the air. And then 
bang immediately after rory is finishes up winning his match interviewed uh he just like i did not be with joe i did not be with joe and that was it and you're like oh that was not squashed in any way shape or form and that was what like todd lewis who's very credible i think that was reporting that so it's like the <laughs> journalism just struggled man it really struggled yeah, it was a rough week. It was it was nice to be firing off twit takes on Twitter and not, you know, it was it was one of those weeks where you're just like, okay, this is I like my job a lot now. <laughs> it was better, much better. Uh all right. Woo! Ryder Cup, baby. The fucking Ryder Cup. Ah, Beth Page. Beth Page, I know we just said that like it's gonna be different and it will be, but it's gonna be chaos there. That might that might be the fork of the road moment for the Ryder Cup. Like they might have to pivot in a different direction after whatever happens at Beth Page because those motherfuckers up the, there are gonna be relentless. I do, I do worry, and and I, I'm excited for it too. Beth Page is, I mean, what a venue, and New York sports fans are just some of the best in the country, best in the world. You ju- you almost got to listen to what Rom said uh, after today's match or whenever it was when he was like. Just everybody be cool. Like, let, let's not go crazy because you all you need is one. We talk about a lot on this podcast how we're stunned in the golf world where it's just a sport where you got to be quiet and you go to a sporting event, you get drunk, you have fun with your buddies. And by some miracle, 99.9% of the time, everyone is quiet at the times when they're supposed to be quiet. Beth Page is going to be a whole different animal. There's going to be hundreds of thousands of people out there rowdy, wanting to live up to like the New Yorker fan um the way people think about them it's it's going to be something again we're two years away so yeah and, and with gambling about, legalized like great. people are going to have a lot of money on it. it it's i'm i am a little bit concerned and you're right it's the, the golf is so unique not not just in that there's expected to be silence when someone is hitting but also how damn close they are like these guys so you can touch you can touch the it's like everyone has a courtside seat and what frankie said earlier about this guy who said something to justin thomas like these guys here you, you you can't not hear i don't think guys who are playing in the nba can hear you know the the crowd calling in some fucking bum because there's some space and everyone's loud and you're playing fast and there's no expectation for quiet so yeah beth page is going to be that will be uh, that story will be played out ad nauseum of oh is this going to oh. be the turning point have we gone too far you know how uh right there's these there's these moments for different entities or or content creators or platforms where your 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 platform sort of transcends what you created and everyone starts pointing at you that you have this responsibility now and it was like you look at whether it's twitter right they just come up with this idea of like oh yeah tweet it. next thing you know it's like terrorists are using your fucking platform to like rally people and like you're like holy shit you're it's messing like, with Facebook elections like, yeah exactly or it's like you know you're you're ranting and raving or joe rogan's like just interviewing people about interesting shit and then all of a sudden he like tra- you know people are blaming him for changing the entire world's perception on like a global pandemic i feel like we might have a lot of responsibility that week going into beth page of like we might all of a sudden have some control over is this going to be too much are people going to go too far and we might have to really be careful going into that week about our messaging for what people should be doing at Beth Page, and we might have to take a lot from what John Rahm said because we we might have more responsibility than we than we want. Well, we also got a wild card in the mix because we got a guy who's from that area. <laughs> he's fucking ten minutes from that place, so he's gonna be like, hey, "Let's go, everybody! Fucking give it to these guys! Go crazy! <laughs> fucking do whatever you have to do to make Beth Page Black Frankie, the greatest Frankie venue of all time." That week. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie yeah. might be wearing a headset he, that week. It's 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 not out of the <laughs> well, realm of possibility. I, I the, yeah, he's the issue is Frankie's going to be on the show for years leading up, being like, "Let's all be respectful. It's a great game, you know." And then literally on the first tease, we run around like with handguns, like fake shit. Boom, boom, take his head off. Fuck these fucking assholes. You're up. <laughs> like, oh my god, relax, just relax. So hey, how about yeah, this? It, if you you let's give us the broadcast. We 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 did a great job at the Corn Ferry event. A lot of bitching about this broadcast. Just let the boys do it. We did our guy all business. Pete could do a bang up job. We'll show every shot. We'll get as many cameras as we need. You'll on Sunday of at Beth Page. Well, you'll have twelve screens to look at, and it'll be all the guys playing. We'll do it. We'll do it right. Just give us the option. You know, we don't even need to make money on it. We just as long as we can like break even, not lose money, because uh, we're a patriotic. And we'll just fucking give you, if it has to be PPV out there, shout out to the Kirk Minahan show who did the first Barstool uh, pay-per-view. I think it did extremely well. We'll go PPV out there and give people a premium option that if you don't want commercials and you want to pay so we can offset our costs and at least break even on this bad boy, we'll get out there and just put this fucking broadcast on commercial-free 
every golf shot will be shown and we'll do our thing. Just give us an option. Give the people an option. The fucking shit part is you just have no option when you're watching the right. You literally don't have a choice other than to just watch the Derek Jeter commercial oh and my fucking God. Annika and Finau hitting driver from like 40 yards and into the water. That's all you have. You just have to watch that. You don't have a fucking choice. It's crazy. It's two thousand four ball. The, the four ball, I know there's a million examples, but the four ball session on Friday when JT and Speed finally were able to play, they they were they were put into action. JT threw his second shot to like nine feet and we just never saw the putt. It, it, I, I almost, I was just like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Again, there's countless examples like that. But for that moment, I, at that moment, I was just like, this is the craziest shit ever. So give us the option. Give us the option. How about on Saturday, on Saturday afternoon session, like there's two matches in the front that are four up. Both of them are four up and oh. they're showing every shot they're showing like what the guys are eating for snacks in between shots and the two matches behind them are all square and one up and one of those matches is jt and spieth and they didn't show a shot from that match for an hour and then they cut to it and it's like shane lowry or somebody has two feet for birdie to win the hole you're like that's what you fucking showed it was crazy town uh this is the last thing i want to say and it's a question do you there's always an overreaction to, to something when this happens like every time a team gets blown out or they lose it's just especially in Ryder Cups there's like we got to change everything and they do and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't do you feel that way about the American squad because I don't I really I really don't think so no 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 I don't either I, I, there was there was you know, one I graphic that I, I want to point out sorry there's one graphic that I saw early this week that stuck in my head and Briggs you were talking about this small sample size and, and how much variance there is so data golf put out a graphic that basically said if every match was a 50 50 proposition right every everyone's equal skill level you know the whatever every match is a coin flip if you played simulated it ten thousand times only 52 percent of simulations would be within a four point deficit at the end so it's like we're you're basically flipping a coin and a lot of times if you flip a coin only 28 times it's not going to be 14 14 yeah no, I, I think that's fair. I think the issue is that, like, in theory, right, the U.S. team is better. They're just – they're ranked lower. The average world ranking is lower. And so it's not a – you know, right? Like, if it – let's say it's supposed to be fucking – it should be ahead 65% of the time or something. How come we're fucking losing? How come it's tails 65% of the time? And I think that's where people have the issue. That's where I have the issue. That's where it's like <clears throat> going into this every year, it's like we're – we're the better team. We were favored. We, U.S. was like was like plus 180 six months ago or something. And I know that teams change and all that, but it's like this team is in theory supposed to be better. They've had the highest ranked players in the world going in for the most part for the last like 30 years yet haven't won in Europe in what's going to be 34 years when they go back in four years, which is just but crazy. But it's, cl it's close so, enough dude, and the uh, sample size is oh. small enough where it's base it, it it's just – it's not – there's not enough time for water to find its level. Like I think, and and the home field advantage, humans being social animals and taking vibes from people so much is such a real thing. I mean, the U.S. almost lost to that in Australia. They needed a comeback against a team that, like, their average world ranking was like 50, and that U.S. team was completely stacked, dude. So on a podcast, I think Riggs, I think you were at the Greenbrier when when you weren't on the podcast. I had mentioned that like I had a lot of confidence in Team USA. I felt great about them leading up. I loved watching the odds start to switch going the other way. And I was like, I want to put a big bet on Team USA. And I was thought I was thinking about it. I was sitting in an Uber with Frankie. We were going to a Barso Classic, and I was like, I want to put five thousand dollars on Team USA. And I was like, I just want to do it because I have that much confidence. I feel good about it. And I didn't end up putting the bet in just because I, I got too nervous, and I, I really just, I didn't th know what was going to happen. So I was like, Ooh. I'm not going to do it. I but I was very close to putting five g's on team usa and if fucking i had that bet in and it's weird to talk about bets that you didn't make but if i had that bet in and Whoa. we were down oh to four i would have lost my fucking mind your Luckily, twitter feed would have been so different you would have been like so bitter you would have been like what throw zach johnson off the nearest bridge that they have in rome <laughs> it would have been bad it would have been really bad but i i didn't do it and but i i'm and i'm very happy that i did not because i would have been in a much different state of mind uh wow wow i thought for sure you were going to say you ended up losing an enormous amount of money i did on not thankfully team usa which would have absolutely stunk uh yep. dan how long are you in rome for i i'm leaving tomorrow morning 
Very excited to get back to my couch, some edibles, uh, DoorDash, and my dog. Very, very excited for that. We've been in Europe for like 10 days now. I've had a great time. It's been an unbelievable week, and it's, it's, been, it's been nice to see the content do well. Like the video, it, you know, the videos of performing like from the media center, I think people see the media center and they're like, oh, this guy's actually on the ground. So, um, and this is, this marks the end of like my first, you know, this is the last real golf of like consequence for the year. Um, and I feel like we're really hitting a stride between like me doing my thing and you guys doing your thing. So, um, tomorrow's going to be a nice, a nice ride home. I'm excited to get home, but I'm also, I feel really good about Barcelona golf and about where we are as a brand and about the future. So I'm, I'm happy despite, I mean, despite the U S loss, I'm happy. And, uh, can we talk about Fitz for a second? He got a win, but it was bad on today was bad and toward the end like he had every chance to hold a winning putt to win the Ryder cup and he just he, you know he could have done it on 17 he could have done it on 16 he hit it in the water on 16 so he, he gets that win with rory but he's now one seven and zero in the Ryder cup which is tough Ooh, i think that that win with rory that's gonna be his takeaway i at least i you know I, that would be my takeaway if i were in that event like yeah you could have hold the yeah, you, you tie that last match and you you secure the Ryder Cup win for Team Europe. But dude, performing that way in front of Rory is pretty fucking cool. I would imagine for a guy like that. Like, dude, he was six hundred through six holes, and Rory was Un- like, "I'm a unreal. passenger, baby. That like, I'm on Matty awesome. Fitz right now." And that's that's a cool thing. I, I hope that's his takeaway because I mean, I'm a, I'm a Matty Fitz guy now that this whole thing is over. So hopefully, he feels okay. A about huge his Ryder Cup for Rory. I mean, Rory was the top Massive. point getter, I believe, on there. T- he was he was yep. uh, five hundred coming in. I think he was like twelve. 12- 12 and five or whatever the hell his tie record was coming in, which is surprising for a guy that we kind of look at during this European stretch of like their guy, you would think he'd have a dominant record. The, the, you know, the, uh, Colin Montgomery does Sergio Garcia does. And now Rory has just vaulted himself in terms of his overall record, which is massive for him. And that's going to be a problem for us. Hovland getting that kind of confidence, Rom with a dominant performance, like their top players dominating is not good for us long-term. One more quote. You ready for this that I just saw? Rory, I've said for six to seven years to anyone that will listen that the hardest thing to do is win an away Ryder Cup, and that's what we're going to do at Beth Page. Oh, <laughs> come on, bro. You're really going to drop that? You're really going to drop that? That's, that's awesome. That's, you don't love that that's, he said that? <laughs> you don't love no, that he I do. said that? I love, I, I, again, I love that he said that. It's it's surprising to me, but I love it for the content purposes. I'm I'm reading the uh, he's feeling reading the transcript. Dude. He's like I'm reading the transcript from the U.S. team uh, press conference, and the guys are really just kind of dunking on Jamie Weir, saying this is the closest team ever. This is the closest team ever. And they were, you know, you said that Justin Thomas CJ, is a straggler. Justin Thomas goes, maybe it was Brooks. We don't see him very often anymore. Brooks goes, yeah, it was exciting to see everybody. <laughs> I felt like I had not seen the guys in a few months. And Zach Johnson goes, that's because he had a baby, right? And and JT goes living it up with the baby. <laughs> oh, all right, see, cl- closest team ever. That's that's Zach Johnson, baby. You know, all the way through. That's that's him getting these guys to come together. Didn't the result wasn't what they wanted, but this this is a brotherhood that these guys are. That's in good right now. because that reminds me of the European press conference two years ago, like when yeah. they got Molly Wapner. I remember that presser. They were laughing. They were like, "Yeah, we're you know we we got killed this week, but we're fine." And then they came out, and turns out they were fine. So that's good that the U.S. isn't. We're not going full like every four years when we lose in Europe. It's like they basically strangle each other. There's rumors that they're fighting each other on the plane. We had the uh, you know the Tom Watson, Phil Mickelson thing in 2014, 2018. We had the Patrick Reed, Justin Reed, New York Times, Jim Furyk, Jordan Spieth thing. This one, it, it seems this is a better. We're handling getting destroyed better, which is good. I agree. What a week. All right, Dan. Safe travels back. Great work. It was, I'll say too, it was really nice to be back on golf Twitter. It felt like it had been a long time since we had been kind of in there. Well, oh boy, there's a Dan lot alluded, of juice out there. Oh, Dan alluded to it, and he's right. Like, I, I wish every week was the Ryder Cup in terms of co- social content. Cause it's like, dude, you, we were all tweeting at like three in the morning and they were getting hundreds of likes. Like, oh, you just don't feeling it. You know, the PJ Tour schedule, you're, you're watching events, you're not watching events. Even if you're tweeting about them, the people are like, I don't fucking know. It's Sunday. I don't want to do that. And, but with the Ryder Cup, it, it gets so, it, people get do, so involved. Do you involved. think it has more juice than what? the Masters? More juice than the Masters? Like socially. Like, do you yeah. think that, I felt like the Twitter streets yeah, were a little hotter. you're more prideful and everybody's more on a side. Nobody's on a side in the Masters. It's like, you're just rooting for the golf course and good times and we're it's, all happy it's spring. We got out of the winter. Whereas this, it's like, you tweet one thing about like USA Max Homo with an American flag and everybody retweets it. They're like, fuck yeah. Politics have really taken that to heart where it's not, it's just like, if you have a side to root for, 
that's where the juice is. And and this one just so happens where it's it's all Americans rooting for one thing. I, I think it does have more juice than than Augusta, yeah. That was as much social juice as I've seen since like a Tiger Woods round. It's like when Tiger plays, that's that's about yeah. as close as it gets where everyone's kind of on the same baby. page of like when Tiger does something well, everybody's doing the everybody's hyped up. When the US does something well, there's a big moment, everybody's hyped up. Whereas even at the Masters, it's like until the end, people are, don't get me wrong, people are excited. You could tweet something generally during the Masters of like, the Masters starts this morning, let's go with like, you know, some amen corner jingle or something and everybody goes crazy. But, uh, you know, there's so much going on. It's not as focused during the Ryder Cup, man. It's fucking us versus them. Everyone's focused and it's just fun to be a part of it. It's, it's I fun. tried to double dip. I tried to double dip. I was, I was tweeting out vague, like, um, America tweets where it was like, Oh, you guys don't dis- you don't you disagree with our leaders' decisions? Like, and then you give up on the country. I won't do that. I'll never do that. And p- I got a couple. I got a couple who are like, what, 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 "What are you talking? What are you fucking talking about?" So I, you know, it's fun. It's a fun event, dude. It's really. I fun. saw that Trent. You were in a bit of a pretzel yesterday, early afternoon session with all the Zach Johnson hate, where he was just he was in public enemy number one, and you were in such a pretzel. And I saw you. You were like waiting. You were biding your time until something good would happen or somebody would say something nice about the leadership or the team, and then you would be like demanding apologies. Like you were like trying to tweet your way out of it a little bit. Well, well dude, the Spieth, JT, Three Wood, Zach yeah. thing really put me in a bind because I, in my heart of hearts, I was like, first of all, there's just no way that Zach was like, oh, you got a drive in your hand. Why don't you grab that Three Wood? Let's do that. There's no way that was happening. So I had to wait. Cause that, what hole is that? Is that, that's, uh, that was 16? like 16. Yeah. So then I had to wait cause I knew he was going to give a quote afterwards and be like, no, I didn't tell him what to hit. We're, we're talking about two of the best players in the world, but that, I'll tell you what, that three hole stretch, that was tough for, for the ZJ high because <laughs> that it, was a- everything was going wrong. They were down by a million. And the one clip of him, like trying to coach the team was him, like maybe saying, Hey, dude, take this club and then fucking speed puts in the water. That was my <laughs> bottom in terms of my Zach Johnson dude. fandom. That was the rock bottom point of the week for all like Team USA. And it was like, for me, I was just piling on. I was like Ugh. memeing up Zach Johnson. Everybody was rallying around it. It was just, oh, you know who was, re- you know who was really piling on was the four play pod Twitter account. I was just <laughs> watching them rip my guy f- limb from limb. And you know uh, what? I didn't say anything because I knew that that's what was getting the juice at that moment. I was like, I, I got fucking, a lot of texts they- from social Rob that were like, this guy's a fucking joke like get this guy off the fucking Ryder Cup you're saying he de- he was saying he doesn't want to see Xander Shoffley ever again in a Ryder Cup like so much Rob is into it I uh, they he would they we were taking real shots at Zach Johnson on our main account but I knew that's what had the juice in the moment and I, I wasn't going to touch it I was just like fine fucking just tear my guy apart it, and you know Whatever. There was a point too. I was like, it was getting so bad that I was like, I'm gonna have to answer for some of these tweets probably because we like we see Zach Johnson around. He's a really nice guy, friend, friend of, the of the program. program. Always comes up to us and like, oh, barstool guys, and gives us the classic like, oh, they'll let anybody in here, kind of like quip, and then we chit chat with them. And I was, as I was just burying him like at his low point, I was like, I. Was, I hope these tweets get lost in all the muck here because I'm going to have to answer for some of these just going after. I think at one point I tweeted like this is the worst U.S. Ryder Cup team in history. And yeah, and you're just going to, you know, if they came back and won, I was like, there's going to be some receipts oh, from this. Dude, from- <laughs> I was going to be out of pocket, as they say on Twitter, if they came back and won. Like, I, I think I would have gotten kicked off the platform. Like that, I was ready because I was saving all these things that people were saying. Just random people. Just everybody. I mean, everybody was tweeting me like, this dude's a disgrace. I was a disgrace. You're a disgrace. Like you should have to move to Australia. Like I was saving all of it. And if, if they came back and won, I might have just, I might have pulled my dick out on Twitter. Like I would have gone crazy, but it dude, didn't happen. Unfortunately, I was just so mad. I was like fired shots. I was like, this team fucking sucks. These guys are horrible. There's no leadership. Zach Johnson's the worst. And then like we had that amazing comeback in the afternoon and I was like, we're back. What a great team. I can't believe they're back. So, yeah, it was a roller coaster. It was an absolute roller coaster. Um, what a Ryder Cup. What an event. It stinks, obviously, stinks that we lost. Europe is fun to watch when they celebrate. Their guys are hilarious. I just saw that clip of Shane Lowry and hugging Tommy Fleetwood, basically making out with him, being like, I fucking love you on camera. So, uh, so yeah, we're going to get a lot of the, that stuff. The fans are coming smart, up too. The, the, fans, hours, so. the fans are great. The, the chants are creative. They were The whole week they were chanting, we're the – 
We're the left side. We're the left side of the T. We're the middle. We're the middle. We're the middle of the T. <laughs> so yeah, it was great. We we just come back with USA and Bruce Springsteen and that Beth Page. I think that's how that works. <laughs> yeah, we try to get more clever. I feel like we're learning a little bit. Like Europe, that's just they've been doing that for centuries of just chanting and singing better than we do. So we'll have to get better. I love that one. That was so perfectly European. Like <laughs> we're the middle. <laughs> It got a good chuckle out of me. We got We're the middle the of the but... tea. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> All right. All right. <sighs> well, uh, Frankie's on his honeymoon, so I don't know that you'll hear from him, folks, for a couple of weeks, but we'll be back on uh, on Thursday. So um, uh, I don't know what the hell we're going to talk about at that point. I imagine there'll be some Ryder Cup fallout that we'll probably have to discuss to some degree. Uh, and then, you know, we're into kind of the golf offseason. Yep. Maybe we'll get some Tiger Woods updates. This might be the time in the next month or so that Tiger could post a swing video. That's kind of what I'm rooting for. Oh, yeah. A swing video. Remember when nice he just dropped that, juice. That, that stinger video in like 2017, like a, a week after the President's Cup or whatever that was, that he just dropped a stinger video out of nowhere and just said like progressing nicely or something, and we all just were coming ourselves? Uh, uh, yeah, fuck. I would say he's – Minus eight hundred to be the Beth Page Black Ryder Cup captain at this point. Uh, yeah, people I, want. I, you know, I, the, the the more you talk about it, I said I initially threw some doubt. I think you're right. I think, especially after this, you know, he can come back. He can position yep. himself. He's the conquering hero. He's the alpha we need. Yep. I think, and I would love. You know what? I would love Sergio Garcia. Uh, they, I, I can't see them running back Luke Donald. There's a lot of talk on European golf Twitter about that. I, I don't think that's really happened. Like Ryder Cup captains going back to back. I want. I would want Sergio Garcia to be the Ryder Cup captain that year. I don't think anyone on Team Europe would have a problem Me with too. it. I think you know. I think you go Tiger would. Sergio. I think that'd be great. I agree. That'd be. I, uh, that would be incredible. One last shout out to Max Homa. He was just a beast, absolute fucking beast. That guy. Uh, the fact that he's not like a major guy, uh, hasn't performed amazing in the majors, hasn't won his majors yet. I think he obviously will. Yet just brings it in the team events is fucking awesome. I remember two years ago when he told the story about how he got fitted for all the gear and then didn't make the team about how devastated he was. Uh, and then he was unbelievable at the President's Cup last year. He was unbelievable this year. That putt that he made to keep the Ryder Cup alive, like. That gave us one more hour of the Ryder Cup. That was mm -hmm. awesome. Like, he literally gave us a full extra hour of the Ryder one Cup. One more hour of commercials that he didn't get paid for. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's fucking awesome. I love that guy. What an absolute stud. This is, too, I for uh, those gambler, golf gamblers out there, you really got to start thinking there's Ryder Cup bumps, man. Like, Scotty Scheffler, two years ago, he was not Scotty Scheffler, and then he beat John Rahm. He partnered with Bryson for the week and then beat John Rahm and then went on a fucking tear and won every event you could win and dominated the Masters. So you might want to start thinking about these Ryder Cup bumps from some good stuff that you saw this week. Max Homo would be one of those guys. So I did uh, see Bryson put up on his Insta story a vid the video of him driving the green on one at Whistling Straits. It, this was at the bottom. This might have been right after he, right after Zach Johnson demanded that Jordan Spieth <laughs> hit a three wood on that hole. I think, I think uh, Bryson just put up that video of him fucking making an eagle on one at Whistling. So that's that's what you're going to get out of that guy. And I hope he's a part of the next team. To be completely honest, that would be Same. great to see. Same. Everything's on the table now. Every every argument now deserves to be heard because of you know when when you get when you get molly whopped, that's what you deserve. Agreed. All right. That was fun. See you, fellas. That was great. Safe travels, Dan. Safe travels home, Dan. And uh, yeah, we'll be back on Thursday. Hit it hard. Hit it hard.